Okay, well, uh, I will assume that uh, we are core eight and um, uh, suggest that we, we start with introductions. See, I, I'm Nick Carey. Um, Tim has uh, asked me to chair this meeting because sadly the poor lad has gone down with COVID, which is most unfortunate. And he says he's got bad brain fog, so he's, he's, he's not kind of skipped through it lightly. So hope he gets better very, very soon. Yeah. So that's me. Um, I'm from Waysphere. Um, Teresa, do you want to go next and then we'll go round round the Ooh, screen? Oh, yeah, I think most people will, those that know here. Uh, so yeah, Teresa Jolly, um, secretary for this uh, from DEF 153. And we'll do an introduction so I can capture names and where yeah. you're all from. I know most of you, but not all of you. So, so Becky, I think there's only one Becky. I was just trying to unmute then, I couldn't get to it fast enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, Rebecca Rowe, Becky, I'm the Service Information Manager at South Yorkshire MCA. Lovely. John? John, uh, uh, John Austin, Moby Have Limited, Transport Geography Consultancy. And Excellent. John Carr, wearing an Association of Transport Coordinating Officers hat today. Excellent. And Mike Baxter. Hi there, yeah, Mike Baxter from Leicester City Council. Um, look after the real time information system there, and we're about to start a re procurement. Excellent. Uh, Julie, Julie Williams. Hi, uh, Julie Williams. I'm Chief Exec for Travel Line and Plus Bus. And did we get John Austin before? Yes, we've got John Austin. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, Stephen, Stephen Turner, that is. Ah, uh, sorry, I just um, had my mic on mute. Can you hear me? Oh, yep. yeah. Oh, we could hear you <laughs> when you said, "Can we hear you?" <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't say anything after that, so that was confirmation that you heard me. Oh, yep. okay, great. Where are you from, Steve? South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined oh, Authority. Fabulous. Thanks so much. Yep. I used to drive I used to drive a Simca, but that was I know from Russia. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, and... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and Sarah, Sarah Aladley. Yeah, that's me. Um, Sarah Ladley. I'm from the Department for Transport and I'm Head of Data Management there. And I'm now the new um, product owner for Naptan. Excellent. And Stephen Penn. Hi, Stephen Penn, um, KPMG, um, working on the bus open data service, primarily on first data. Excellent. And then we've got a number of people who are not on camera. Chris Sherry, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, Chris Sherry here from Passenger Technology Group. Uh, we build apps and websites for the bus industry. And Keith Willis. Uh, yeah, Keith Willis from React Accessibility. And Rob West. Hi, yeah, Rob West, founder and um, I guess main software architect at Illidium, um, building things with uh, Trans Exchange and Naptan and NetX, uh, primarily for bus open data. And uh, David Batchter. David Batchter from Ticketer, helping operators get their ticket machines sorted out and bots. And Dan Saunders. Oh, yeah, Dan Saunders from Base Up Head of Products. Uh, we do lots of stuff for public transport data, so run the TMDS, run the NCSD, and uh, do stuff around 15 minute cities and neighbourhoods, which I'm sure we'll come on to later on. So, hi. And Mark Jones. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Jones from DST, and I work on the BOTS uh, project. And uh, Peter Stoner. Hello, yes, Peter Stone from Eto World, very much looking after or interested in data quality issues and uh, on the data using side of the business. And Josh Goodwin. Uh, Josh Goodwin from BusTimes.org. Graham Brown. 
Hi, I'm Graham Brown from the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. I'll go I'll after the transport system up there. Chris Sherry. I've already oh, gone, we, I think. We done, Chris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We yeah, we have. Chris. Yeah. <laughs> right. We have apologies from Mira, Mira Naya from DFT, Nick Truscott from Cornwall, Neil McKinnon from Stagecoach, and Ian Barrett from Lancashire. Um, the notes of the last meeting on the 9th of June were circulated. Um, is there any comment on those? I shall note that as uh, no one demurred. So then we're <clears throat> straight into BODS, the Bus Open Data Digital Service. And uh, we have various contributions from, from Mark, Mark Jones, uh, too, and Stephen Penn. So, um, and then Sarah will be talking to us after that about NAPTAN. So uh, over to you guys. Cool, um, I'll jump in. Uh, Mark, again. Um, I haven't got a slide, so I'm just going to talk. Uh, it's just a quick update on some of the work we've been doing on BOD since we last spoke at the PTEC meeting. Um, so yeah, a few updates. First of all, apologies from Triumph. He couldn't join the call today. Um, <clears throat> we've been working on, uh, start on BOD. We've been working on the BOD program and development. Current version is 1.19. Um, and there's been a recent release on that. Uh, that version included some revisions to how or the logic for service codes are dealt with, um, just to allow how that is processed from a particular uh, tech supplier for the timetable data. Um, and there's ongoing conversations really around how that process uh, is working going forward as well. Um, we have also been working with the DVSA to increase compliance for timetables. Um, we have identified the outstanding operators and the number of um, services that they're not currently supplying data for, and they've opened up a number of cases with those particular operators to, to, um, to review their standards. Um, as part of that compliance piece as well, we've also been working with the OTC and we're currently developing an integration with their API. Um, so that allows us to pull live data about the registrations within that OTC database. Uh, and that's vitally important for us so that we understand the baseline data that's, um, that we're trying to match to when we're looking at compliance for bots. Um, we've also been looking at the feasibility of publishing tram and light rail data on the BODS platform. And we've been speaking with the current um, light rail operators to understand the data they have available and the um, appetite to supply that data to the BODS platform. Uh, so that's ongoing. Um, <clears throat> we've also been looking at options about the trans exchange tool. As you know, the smaller operators, the DFT um, sponsored a quite a lightweight solution um, via Excel, I believe, to allow smaller operators to produ uh, produce timetable data in a trans exchange format. And what we're looking at now is the next generation of that, a uh, more sophisticated solution for timetable production. Uh, that's ongoing. Uh, we're looking at the fair standards, and I think Stephen's going to give an update on that. Uh, we're also working at looking at going back to compliance. We're understanding how some operators, some services um, need to be excluded from the BODS validation okay. process. So we're building in exceptions um, functionality into the back end of the system uh, to help with that. Uh, we're also looking at how um, disruptions data can be uh, obtained from local authorities. Uh, we inherited the TFN disruptions tool and we're looking at the future of that to understand how more local authorities can be onboarded, but also the future about a national disruption okay. service. Um, we have concluded or about to conclude the 15 minute neighborhood discovery project uh, and a paper is going to be produced from that. And I believe there's an update later on on this call on that as well. Uh, what else are we doing? We are also looking at options really for the future of BODS. So um, come, got a lot of work to do up for this financial year, but beyond that, we're looking at 
and trying to understand what the direction of travel is, what how boards can evolve, what the appetite is for that. Um, speaking to quite a lot of stakeholders and we're currently putting together an options paper to understand what we can do and what can't we do. Uh, and I'm focused on the ABOD solution. So ABOD is the reporting analytics platform that was recently updated to version 1.6. And that now includes corridor speed metrics. So historically, we had corridors being able to um, join stops together, to look at the performance, punctuality performance of the corridor. Now we can look at the speed uh, of the whole corridor or individual segments of that as well. We also introduced authority filtering. So authorities can then look at, um, or people who have got more, more than one authority can look at specific operations within their authority. Uh, we're also working on version 1.7 and that will include some more granular level reporting mm -hmm. around journey analysis and that should be released um, probably in November at this at this point. Uh, and finally we're working with DVSA again on ABODs to understand how they can use it for their compliance monitoring and they have and their own unique uh, requirements for the service. That's me. A few updates. Well, Mark, that's. I can see two <laughs> quite a list. Uh, it, it, we, you, yes, you've you've gathered quite a a, a fan club. Um, <laughs> I let you run. I, I would have assumed that people would have crashed into your very fluent, without hesitation, deviation or repetition, uh, <laughs> delivery there if it was urgent. But uh, I'll take it was Stephen Turner who raised his hand first. I think so, Stephen. Yeah, sure. I did post a comment as well. It's a question about whether you've considered a tram train vehicle that operates as a tram becomes a train and how that can get reflected in the BOD data. Sorry, you broke up for me briefly. A tram train, do you say? Yeah, because yeah, this is a particular issue in Sheffield where they, they uh, stagecoach run those services and um, there's a sort of a a slightly shaky handover to um, the Darwin data and, yeah. and we don't get a, a, a good connection there. I will follow that through. I know that the team has spoken to the people at Stagecoach at Supertram to understand what data is available um, from that service, but the specific on that particular service, um, I will need to follow up on. Thank you. But thank you for thank raising you. it. Yeah, is that OK, Stephen? Is that does that come? Yeah, with? sure. It's yep. really questioning that it's been looked at and if there's any improvements that can be made <laughs> in how data is processed now. Because it is a, a live issue and has been for many years and uh, Becky yeah. drew it to my attention some some time ago. I think it'd be worth writing to Mark, actually, Stephen, if you if you could just to sort of detail the the issues and and because I uh, uh, stagecoach have taken quite a long time to kind of respond I think yeah uh, and it may be because there's real ch real challenges at their end we don't know yeah there may be um background issues that present that but the um the trans train concept is trialed in South Yorkshire and it might become more nationally rolled out um so it's worth having a look at it are you going to be sharing contact details I've just um, dropped uh, my email address in the chat. So okay, um, okay. thank you. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Thank you. I'll look at your email. Okay, thanks. Useful. Thanks for thanks for raising that. Um, and Mike, Mike Baxter. Hi there. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have to admit, I I don't use bods a great deal um, because I've not had the chance because of other work pressures. But one thing I have known noticed is that, well. Uh, another part of the organization had a, a, a journey planner developed where they're taking the data for Leicester from from bods and and <coughs> if if an operator misses services out of their submission to bods it isn't necessarily picked up and I'm presuming that that's something that might be uh, getting um, sort of spotted with with this sort of tie in with DVSA and OTC is is that is that the idea of that because operators can like you know submit a, a set of data but they've missed out service X or service Y and so in the journey planner it doesn't re reveal that information and and there doesn't seem to be a great deal of checking of 
how often people update the BODS data as well. There's a, there is a daily check um, that's done in the back end of the system that validates the registration number or the service code of the operation uh, and data is used to understand where the gaps are um, for operators. What that's really doing at the moment or the focus on uh, by the DVSA is to identify those operators that are supplying nothing at all as opposed that's, that's, to... That's what I thought, yeah, yeah. yeah. But over time, I think there will need to be a, a closer scrutiny of the data to understand it is timely, uh, that there is that complete data set. But um, yeah, yeah but there are there is a output at the moment to look at that. And, but the focus, like I say, is on something a bit different. Right, Would okay. it be helpful at the moment if authorities that were aware of gaps in services notified uh, DFT, Mark, would that would that be a useful addition? Yeah, it certainly would help um, kind of validate the, the data that we've got around operators and their current compliance. OK, is, thank is you. Is there a mechanism for doing that? Is it just email? And... There is, yeah, there's the help desk. But if you want yeah. to email me directly, I can look at it. OK. That. OK, because the other thing that I'm aware of, the, the, the ABOD solution um, is I've not had a chance to to actually get up to date with the um, training on that. But when I had a quick look at it, it, I couldn't seem to make it work. But that might just be my login is restricted. Is, is there some training out there for the ABODs? Or? Yeah, so um, I've actually done quite a few sessions myself um, in the last week or so with new authorities. Sorry, you're, you're, dropping, you're dropping out, actually. Um, can you hear me now? Mark, that's a bit better. Yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't. I don't know if it's affecting other people being able to hear, but it certainly was me. I'll, I'll try and go a bit closer to the screen. Unfortunately, that's, a bit that's... closer to my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was saying uh, I've, better. Taken, I've undertaken quite a bit of training with some of the local authorities in the last week or so. So, I'm, um, if, yeah, if you drop me an email, I can set up a session with you to go through the ABOD uh, reporting. Right. OK. Um, All right. Several hands raised. Uh, Thanks, Mark. I think I'm not sure in what order, but uh, Ju Julie, I think uh, no, Julie's made a comment which is very useful. That uh, I I encourage you to look at Julie and Peter Stone's comments uh, in the chat because they're relevant to what we covered earlier. Uh, but uh, look, Becky, you've raised your hand. Um, yeah, it was about the disruption side of things. Um, I know. Uh, Mark with cross paths at other, other meetings and have raised different questions, so I won't duplicate. Um, but um, with the disruptions um, stuff, obviously it moved over from TFN and it was the, the, the five big authorities in the north originally, uh, and then it moved over to, to the DFT. Um, the transport API hub that uh, had been created, that ended in March, and then there was nothing uh, then available uh, provided by the DFT effectively. We were still using the, the tools to enter information, but the DFT hadn't provided anything to replace um, the, the ended contract and the, and the hub that TAPI provided. Um, so it, if that's all going into effectively into BODS as a, as a national disruptions um, hub, um, will the tools yeah, yeah, number one, will the tools that have already been created and it's it's ITO that created the, the tools, isn't it? Will they still remain or will there be some new tools and new development on that? Yeah, so um, it's, it's very much early stages um, in terms of what we're looking at. Um, and the option is, um, yeah, we're looking at all the options available uh, for what the source of that information would be, which tool would be used. But currently... Be, sorry, go sorry. Oh, you go. I was wondering, will there be some um, sessions on that to, to get input into how that should be? It's just that we've obviously developed on the back of that to display information to our customers. And if there are structural changes, that could affect that. Um, but also if um, th there are there are issues with it and things that didn't quite get to where we wanted them to be, um, you know, a, a chance to actually have input into any further expansion on what, what what's actually available data wise. Yeah. So certainly once a decision is made as to what tool we would use to um, obtain disruption data, there would be a lot of stakeholder engagement to understand what the requirements are, what the problems are with the current tool and 
what needs to go into the new system going forward. Great, yeah, because I think the other, the other concern was about who who could actually enter data because one of our issues that we do get is that um, say uh, operators aren't necessarily um, they don't choose necessarily the right words let's say about an incident <laughs> um, I've seen some really bad examples so, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> so we are we are you know we do have some concerns if it's open too widely as to who can uh, enter in, data into it and at, at the moment there is actually a process where not everybody can actually approve and publish so you know it might be that operators may be able to enter data but somebody else has to approve and publish so it actually can be shown to, to, to customers but now that, that that's great as long as it's going to be some uh, some uh, consultation and stuff and input that's great thank you thank you uh, Mark can I suggest that it it might be an idea if you're not already doing so to manage expectations by putting that out over the through the the bods uh, email channel uh, your regular kind of newsletter announcement thing to just kind of say what sort of timetable you're looking at for for this because disruptions particularly in the you know the big authorities is is a really live issue uh, uh we come across it a lot um uh councillors get lobbied uh to uh, improve disruption information, particularly cancellations and stuff like that. Uh, West Yorkshire have got quite a quite a slick system, um, and uh, Becky in South Yorkshire is 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 uh, kind of one of the the leads on kind of you know the future of this. So well well worth kind of getting your head around it and and uh, putting something in. Um, Keith and Dan, I'll take Keith first and then Dan. Uh, yeah, it was about your next gen trans exchange tool. I didn't quite catch. You said you were looking at it. But was that looking at it, developing it, trialing it? What what stage were you at with that and the time scales for it? OK, yeah. Uh, so we are reviewing um, options for how that data would be captured in various different systems and the merits of those systems at the moment, um, looking at how uh, for ease of use and the financial models. Um, so there's a, a discovery process ongoing for that at the moment. Um, the next phase will be to look at um, how it's funded, when it will be funded. So I, there's no current time scales for that, but um, when there is, I'll update you. All right. So you don't know whether you're going to buy something or make something, or um, you're going to make something within all the other stuff that you're doing, buds, rather than no, buy something. I, it's unlikely we're going to make something, I would say. Right. Um, excellent. So that's Keith. Uh, Dan, Dan Saunders. Hi, yeah, Hi, Mark. Um, just a quick question around kind of compliance levels of the BODS uh, routes and timetables. Do you have any idea of how much is actually being provided by operators, how many services, and what you're kind of missing out as a rough as a rough percentage? I think in our previous updates, we've kind of got a number of you know, how many operators are done and, and this type of stuff. Do you have any idea? Is that kind of getting close to 100% now or? Getting closer um, is right here. Um, off the top of my head, I think 500 operators are in scope of BODs. We have 80% of operators onboarded, and that equates to currently looking at the OTC database, 70% of registrations. Um, of those 30% that are missing, um, that's about 70 operators, I think. And if you took the top 10% of those 70 operators, they account for um, 80% of missing uh, journeys, uh, missing registrations. So that's the focus on DVSA is that top 10% of missing operators, and they will really make a significant difference to um, the compliance figures. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks. And another right. quick. It relies on DVSA um, really following up that process. Okay, uh, and then a quick follow up, uh, maybe not so much for yourself, but more of an open kind of thing. Uh, I know there's been rumours of similar kind of BOD stuff happening in Wales and Scotland. I just wonder if anyone around the group's heard any more updates about about their kind of open data kind of platforms or anything like that at all. I'm aware um, it's ongoing uh, in Wales. Um, they do have aspirations to provide a Welsh BOD service. Um, I'm not aware of any details. Okay, thank you. Oh, 
there's nothing like the popularity of uh, of coming on uh, a call from DFT. <laughs> thank you for thank you for fielding everything so well. Uh, we better we better crack on, uh, Stephen. Uh, Sorry, hey, you're. Favorite. you're I can actually answer Dan's question. An ITT was issued by Transport Scotland recently. It's out and open at the moment uh, for their kind of full digital offer. And uh, no, Thanks, I think Stephen. you have a slot, do you not, Stephen? I think I do, but Keith just put his hand up. <laughs> right, Keith. Sorry, that was, was left. I'll remove it. That's a legacy hand. OK, legacy hand, yeah. good. OK, Stephen Penn. OK, yeah, I've yours. not managed to uh, make any slides, so it's going to be a verbal update because I've not had time. Um, so as was mentioned in the notes from the last PTIC uh, about sort of plan we had for improving fares data, you know, we're going to implement a series of validations um, over the course of the year. Um, so we're a bit behind the time scales as was defined at the last PTIC, um, but we do now have a small development team in place um, and we have begun work on an application that will run a series of additional validation rules on any NetEx published reports over and above the, the base schema, the base XSD. Uh, because as we know, obviously at the moment there are serious data quality issues with the NetEx being published affairs. There's lots of inconsistency. Every different system supplier sort of supplies a different structure. Uh, so the validation rules will be essentially mandating that um, you know all, all details relating to a product are contained in the same XML document. That there is a consistent and mandatory way of defining a tariff and a consistent and mandatory way of defining a product type. Um, and then also, I guess, additional rules around you know making sure that when you declare a line or whatever that it relates to the trans exchange file equivalent that's been published on bots. So that's what we're developing at the moment. It is, it is kind of you know in flight, so to speak. Um, I think we're hoping to have it deployed to the BOTS UAT site um, late in October. Um, and at that point, it's probably going to sit on that UAT site for quite some time because our plan is to run through all the NetX data that's already published um, and then see what kind of error reports are being generated and then communicate them to the system suppliers of NetX. So basically VIX and Ticketer, possibly Transmac and Illidium, depending on how their progress goes with producing NetX. And then try and essentially deal with those problems that are being generated in the reports before we actually roll the validation out to the production environment, uh, simply to avoid the situation where we have operators receiving error reports that consist of tens of thousands of lines of errors, none of which they control because they're all just about the structural um, sort of def deficiencies of their supply of NetEx. Um, so, yeah. There'll probably be a lot of work going on behind the scenes, basically from late October onwards, dealing with the NetEx system suppliers to ensure that they're all you know, providing consistent and structured NetEx. Um, so hopefully by the next PTIC, you know, we should start to see that kind of, you know, that will be live in the production environment and we should start to see the quality of the NetEx uh, massively improve, which obviously deals with one of the issues we have at the moment, consistency, the other one is completeness. Um, obviously we'll move on to completeness once we have, um, I guess, a consistent type of NetEx that's being produced. Because at the moment, there's no point in pushing the completeness agenda when obviously we're going to get a complete set of inconsistent data. Um, so that's the timescales at the moment. You know, we're working on the application now. It should be on the UAT environment by late October. Um, and then hopefully, you know, depending on how well the conversations with the major ETM suppliers go, hopefully it'll be on production, the production environment bots by late November. Um, and then we will be starting on the second iteration of the VEDLA data, um, which is going to start looking at things that are perhaps a little more in the user's kind of control tightening up pricing structures, how they're expressed in NetEx. So you can't use a fair triangle to express, a fair triangle with the same price in every cell to express a flat fare or a period ticket, those sorts of things. Um, expansion of like um, granularity of user types, you know, so you can't just say it's a child, just to define what a child is. And then of course, start to look at the complex fares, um, particularly post pay products. And um, so that sort of, that, that work will probably start in November time, I think. And that's pretty much what we had in the timescales, as was explained at the last PTIC. So yeah, that's where we are with, I guess, NetEx being published at Boss for Fairs. Um, does anything I said raise any questions or eyebrows or challenges? I'll take I have one. <laughs> go on, I then, go one. on. Um, I, I'd, I'd love it if you applied this consistency uh, uh, approach to um, the attempt to try and align 
uh, two fields, only two fields with similar names in um, uh, the uh, Siri VM output and the Trans Exchange output. Uh, so far, this has proved to be impossible. So you look at the Trans Exchange, it does not join up. So you can't do a journey match without inference or using other fields. And and it was Tim Rivett's uh, 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 work with DFT that kind of established this, but the, the timetable providers are dragging their feet. And I'm not sure where we got to with with uh, Ticketer either um, or yes, the other. Um, I mean, that's a fair point. And obviously it's a, it is an ongoing issue. Um, I think that's more of a, more of a compliance issue, um, you know, um, so it's not really for me to comment. You know, my job is to, I guess, I guess, build validation and define validation, not drag the operator's feet over hot coals to um, to ensure that they meet those rules. Um, I think there is work still going on, conversation still going on with the, the business change team and tests um, with the suppliers, um, but that's sort of outside my, you know, I focus on fares mainly. But we will be making similar demands uh, and enforcing demands. Um, for NetEx to reference to Trans Exchange in a consistent manner, and we will be running what we're calling post-publishing checks on those. Those will be built probably early next year, um, so we can, I guess, get a full picture of what services we expect there to be fares data for, and what fares data there actually is, um, and then start to sort of clamp down on it that way. Uh, there is a root cause for this issue, though, which is that um, it is the operators who are required to comply. Uh, but it is the timetable providers that actually provide the means, and 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 there's a lot of uh, you know pointing in both directions. So I have a lot of sympathy actually for the timetable providers who are not uh, under the legislation, and and who are not necessarily uh, earning a, a, a lovely pretty penny out of doing this, and the operators who can get uh, censured uh, under the legislation, but they quite rightly because they're trying to run buses they've outsourced that many years ago to the huge timetable providers who are not you know particularly as engaged because of the way that it's it's working and i think that is likely to continue unless the timetable providers can be brought into the fold and and for that matter the real time providers to kind of be part of the caucus of people that actually make make this work I know you've done a lot of engagement, but they're not, they're not, it's the, it's the poor blooming operators that are under the act, not the timetable providers. Yeah, I mean, I guess how we, um, yeah, how, how we apply pressure, I guess, is not my call. I mean, Mark, I think this is probably something I guess we should take away as an action or not an action, but um, a comment from this meeting, I think, you know, obviously within the boss team, there are people working on this and we are aware it's essentially um, an open saw and until it's resolved, you know, I guess the, the data isn't as valuable as it should, as it should be um, on bots. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a non-issue. There's a useful comment on it from Judy as well. Um, right. So if that is your section complete Stephen and thank you for it um we'll move on to the Naptan project can and I just, Sarah can I just, just carry oh on yes that? yeah um, my... sorry to butt in um Nick um, it's fine it's fine um so this this um this problem that you're talking about is basically talking about journey matching and making sure vehicles yeah. are tracking so it's not strictly to do with fares obviously you just brought that in as an no. example no but uh, but the same kind of software and data completion and and uh uh accuracy measures it's the same kind of thing you know can i make a match with this is it complete and and can i make a match between two fields so there's no requirement on the the ticket the the siri feed to have the journey uh journey number only in only indirectly through the profile right which the operators are expected to comply with, but the timetable providers and the, the real-time providers are not. And that's really the number of the issue. Okay. Anyway, I'll be guilty of Thank delaying you. the meeting. Um, let's move on to Sarah. <laughs> Hi there. 
Okay, so I thought I'd just run you through a few things. Um, this is obviously my first one of these, so in future I'll be a bit more prepared. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of Naptan, you may have heard that sort of we've finished, we say finished the redevelopment side of things at the moment. So we've moved into what we call service team. Um, so that'll be again headed up by myself as a product owner and um, we've also got a product manager and we've got a delivery manager so we do have some um, technical tickets and some technical work still to finish off from the redevelopment um, but all in all the service is mostly up and functioning as we would expect it. Um, the new upload service for Naptan went live seems we, you know there's a couple of uh, tweaks to be had with that but everything seems to be running smoothly um, unless anyone tells me differently today that they're not able to upload data but we've had the, all usual updates through that and we've had people requesting new logins um, for that service and um, in terms of NPTG or NUPTIG depending on how you like to pronounce that um, there's a new internal upload process so um, this, this is the um, location and locality side of the Naptan data and so myself and a couple of team members are able to update that ourselves at the moment any requests for that can come through the usual Naptan inbox um, and we can we can see that those are, are amended um, and we will be looking to open that up again to um, the public and people to be able to um, upload into that um, in terms of Naptan development at the moment we have um, what we call Naptan Mapper. Um, obviously, we've got colleagues on the call here from ITO World. So, as you will have known, we, we worked with ITO World previously um, to have the um, transport stops uh, located onto a map um, through their software um, and displayed online. And what we've done is we've in housed that part of it now. So, it's written in, in our code um, and it will be published um, on the web. Um, in the intermediate bit at the moment, um, due to DFT wanting to go through uh, quite rightly some security measures, um, we, we have um, just selected people that are able to log in. Uh, we'll be taking this um, to a public meeting and explaining how to do that. So like I say, it's an R code, so it's a bit, bit codey, and then there's a GitHub, which is where you pull code from. And even for someone like myself, um, that's not the usual way that I, I would want to be going around this, but that's the intermediate step. Um, but it's literally sort of a, a click and play sort of thing in the code which I'll show everyone when we do the public meeting and that will be probably in the next two weeks that I set that up so um, notification and communication will go out about that. Um, so yeah that'll be the new Naptan mapper. Also we'll do a public meeting about the future of Naptan and um, so some of you might have been aware that we had um, a project um, running alongside the usual day to day of Naptan which is to investigate where Naptan could go in the future. Um, so the Two main areas that are highlighted there were micromobility, which includes obviously bikes and e-scooters, that kind of thing. And the other side of it was accessibility. Um, and on that, we did do a bit of an extension to that project and we looked into bus, bus accessibility um, as a main, bus and bus stop. And we are proposing to go out for a longer discovery project that will go out to tender um, in the next few months and look to start that next year for a big accessibility piece for NAPTAN. And on that, we basically went round to people already in this space, in this field, um, looking at accessibility in, in trains. Um, you know, there's a few things going on there. Um, a lot of people have collated data to do with bus stops and accessibility. So we're not planning to reinvent the wheel and we're not planning to send something out where we request certain data types at the moment. We're just looking at the types of data that are involved here and what could be useful if it did go into nap time. We're not suggesting that it does right now. It's uh, an investigatory discovery piece, um, as noted. I'll just stop there. Um, there's not much more to go on, but I've got a couple of questions. Um, just looking at hands. Becky <laughs> was first, I think. There we go. Yep, me again. Um, just a quick one on the Naptan mapper. Mm -hmm. um, a, um, a few months back, I can't remember when exactly, because time just passes quite quickly at the moment. <laughs> um, the uh, the Ito Naptan viewer was closed down, and that mm -hmm. allowed us to actually uh, view and resolve Naptan warnings. And at the moment, we've got no way uh, of doing that. Will this tool resolve that? It should do eventually, yeah. What we're doing is we're releasing it in iterations because we know this tool is, is valuable to the community. So the version that we release um, that I'll take everyone through will at least show you where the stops are on a map and you can sort of hover over them and click on a locality and it'll show you all the stops within that locality. Um, there will be further features added, um, as you've said, you know, some bits about the data quality, some helpful things that were there before. And we'll just iterate on that, like from now until December, for example. Um, but yeah, we're just releasing it in installments so that you at least have something to work with. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And Mike. Yeah, Mike sorry. I'm, 
my my question was also about the Naptan mapper. Um, so yeah, I, I, obviously a lot of people use it. We use it. Bus companies use it um, just for general information. When um, I, I don't, it sounds like you're sort of uh, releasing it in in a sort of develop a, a development sphere to start with, which is not really what what will suit me and most people I know. When will it be available? to people who have not got the development um, expertise or capability or, or environment? Absolutely. So the only reason that we're releasing it like that, like I say, is due to security at the moment um, on, on the system. And we want to make sure that's in place. So we have to take it through various processes um, within DFT. So as soon as that happens, we're able to release it as an open link and it will just be like a web page um, like yeah. the I2 World one used to be. So that is the aim. I haven't got a timeline on it yet because we'll wait for, the, for that security to be reviewed, which is why I want to do the public meeting just to show that you can use it with a couple of quick clicks if, if anyone is you know, wanting to look at it technically for now, but I do understand that it's not the ideal way and it's not the way that we plan to have it out there in the future. So so would it be likely to be before Christmas that we could use it? I think, yeah, it, it looks like it would be, yeah, for sure. You can but definitely we, use it before that now, but with the technical sort of click-throughs. and okay. yeah, so, yeah, so Will, we can will it require it a login? Um, no, it shouldn't do. They're not, okay. not the first release that we have it until we have features that we might want to look into certain things. Uh, we won't okay. have it like that. Yeah. If you do want to see it in its development um, form, if you see yeah. it's more raw form. Yeah. Do, do you have to have is, is that only possible if you've got access to GitHub and stuff like that? Is that is that what you're saying? Um, I do not about access, but you'd, you'd need to get a GitHub page up and, and pull it from there. Yes. Yeah. So I think you right. might have to get a login for it, but I'll show you because I've already got it. So it's a bit hard to explain. But yeah, right. um, it's not too technical. It would literally no. be like a login. I, I know that things like screen. GitHub are, are blocked on yeah. our, um, I see. On, on sort of IT. Yes. By, by council IT or certainly our council IT is, is yeah. a problem for that. Yeah. I'll bear that in mind. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. OK, thank you. Cheers. Sorry, I can't give any more. It's all right. Understood. Uh, we've got uh, John Carr and then we've got uh, Chris Sherry and then Becky. You're on mute, John. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, my concern is, is about what effectively I might call box ticking in terms of accessibility. Um, I've very recently seen a splendid example of a level boarding bus stop, you know, castle curb, nice information display, all the rest of it. The only trouble was that the length of the stop was the only bit of hard standing there. And to get through it, I would imagine it'd be a very, very brave wheelchair user and indeed quite a confident uh, walking stick user that would assay the muddy paths and fields that surrounded it. And there are similar occasions in um, the uh, urban areas. <clears throat> and is there any way, do we think, I realise I'm asking quite a, a difficult and perhaps new area of, of technical uh, research, that we can actually look at the accessibility of bus stops as being we can actually get people with disabilities, people with limited abilities to them from the points at which they actually wanted to start or finish their journey. You know, in other words, if they're in a the shopping area, can they get to the majority mm -hmm. parts of that shopping area? If they're in a residential area, are there clear identifiable paths to all of the houses within the catchment area of the bus stop. I guess the way that you would do it would probably be to to use something like Google Maps that was reasonably universal. Mm -hmm. So to make an assessment, how you would make that assessment, I know not. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And they're all really good, valid points. Um, and it's definitely something that was thrown up within the discovery. Like you say, there's a lot of people discussing sort of being able to get off at a stop and into a shelter, but not actually able to come out of the shelter again unless they went onto a bus. And I thought that must be a bit scary for some people, you know, to be planning a journey like that. Um, and, and again, about sort of the terrain around the bus stop, um, you know, not just the, the flat surface. So all of this did did come up. Um, 
and again that's why we're, we we are advising that we go for a, a larger discovery piece because there's a lot more to this picture really um pardon the pun with google maps and pictures but you know the 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 landscape for that it is is set out um google maps i'm looking at that did come up as a way to be able to review that but the other thing is with google maps sometimes it's only every year or two years so it can be a bit outdated so different areas are doing different things some people do some local authorities do have a, a mechanism by mean by way they take picture of a bus stop as well to show what's at the bus stop you know um and there's just so many different levels of accessibility some people suggested doing a a grading like one two and three but that's not really suitable because uh, one person needs to determine for themselves if they think they could access that bus stop um so yeah um they're definitely all points that were taken on board and the journey to and from different places have been taken into account especially if it's from um a house or from a station to a bus stop that kind of interchange as well to change onto different public transport points um does that answer your question yeah that's very good thanks I mean, I think there's a limit probably to what Natan could do with that. Uh, I is, think it's yeah. a huge issue, yeah. John, and I think it's a really vital one. Um, and uh, DFT, uh, I think you may still have colleagues, Sarah, that look look at the physical accessibility aspects of transport. And it might be worth uh, convening some kind of group to kind of really really take take this forward because it, it's absolutely vital there's no point in having a bit of hard standing at a stop if you can't even get to the stop absolutely um, yeah we, we have been engaging with those in, even internal groups that even i wasn't aware of so it's been a really good hmm. collective piece really to bring us together and realize that this is like you say it's much bigger than that and um, so we, yeah. we want to make sure that we're all joined up and feeding in for sure yeah, yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right uh, Nick, it, it, it's clearly far bigger than that town. It, it, in fact, I would say it also comes into the journey planning area. When we're procuring uh, tech, we, we tend to say, how does it perform in terms of efficiency, speed of doing things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I know I've certainly procured journey planners like that. But when you come to be a real world user, then no matter how technically good, if the journey planner is not able to tell you something which actually facilitates your journey, then it's not much good at all. <laughs> so right. we, we, we do need to, as you say, convene something that explores these issues. Yeah, I think we We'll, we'll leave it there. Um, I commend the meeting to two useful comments from Dan Saunders and Julie Williams in the chat. Um, OK, uh, we are now going to if <coughs> they've joined, which they may not have done, but we are expecting um, uh, the Rail Data Marketplace introduction. Um, do we have I don't think we've got Claire Marcy and Carl Selly, Selby here yet. Nick, just a quick one. You mentioned that, uh, you, Chris, Sherry, did you have any comments on that last one while we're waiting for the next? Uh, yeah, I, I, two comments. Uh, well, one was a question which was just asking whether I could have the uh, GitHub link because I'd be uh, really interested to look at the Naptan mapper. Uh, and, and the other one was uh, about using open data. So we use OpenStreetMap for which um, helps power our journey planner. Uh, and if we have a, an issue with uh, something being a bus stop not being accessible by a, a certain mode of transport <coughs> route or wheelchair accessible because it's open data we can go and update that if it's wrong whereas uh, using proprietary software or things like google it, it's a lot slower to update so i would uh, advocate using open data for that good point i, I, I would have to uh, say something uh, so we've done some work using open street map data and because there are some checks and balances there and lots of the uh, agreements are done using automated rules. We've seen some data has been quite wrong in OpenStreetMap data. So the problem is um, it's not necessarily authoritative data. Um, so yeah, we have had to unedit edited data when we've realized it's not actually 100% correct. So yeah, I'll just do a bit of a caveat against that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's hard hard to get this stuff right. Uh, what what we like about open data is that if it is wrong, we have the power or everyone has the power to go and correct it. Thank you. Very useful. Uh, John, was that an 
legacy hand or do you did you have another point you wish to you're on mute again legacy legacy okay uh then i think we've got a few moments um seven moments until we were due to start talking about the real data marketplace and i don't think we've had our, our guests join the meeting yet um so in the meantime perhaps this is a a useful moment to just um explore john's point about the wider accessibility uh peter stoner made a very useful point that julie commented on that um actually quite a lot was done for the olympics about accessibility because the, the nation realized that it was going to be a huge own goal if we didn't get that right but that has not been maintained so from 2012 onwards um all of that good work has lain fallow so there's stuff that can be done and there are different parts of dft that are engaged with this um that that could be brought to bear and it it, it is yes a wider issue than naptan but naptan can potentially has the potential to support uh, measures of how accessible a stop is as opposed to how accessible the facilities at the stop are and i think that's that that's the yeah, number really that that's 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 where the scope of the project seemed to go obviously it could mm. say what what is it a stop what is it a bus um you know a terminus like for example if there is disabled toilets at, at some of them so it would be very location based obviously in naptan um there is stuff that sits outside that even for example we started to take a foray into like for example um the e-scooters we're not saying we'd look at where all these scooters are but maybe e-scooters that are placed at a tram stop at a train stop that help you sort of get between one one mode of transport to another um, again these were all just suggestions that came up in the discovery um but but accessibility on its own is, is is a major piece and obviously would require additional data points in that time whereas like for example bikes and e-scooters would be the same data points effectively you know you know, east things, north things, longitude, latitude of where those locations are. Whereas accessibility, that's what's to be discovered. It might have to be a separate data set still set within NAPTAN um, that describes lots of those stops. And there are a lot of obviously journey planners and apps, you know, some people are in this meeting that, that already collate that data. Um, the, the stuff that was done for the Olympics, as was noted, I know that NAPTAN was it expanded for that in, in some respects. Um, and that's something to look back it was, into. Yeah. yeah, obviously me myself being new, I've not looked into that type of data that was collected and what what you know what the use of it was um if it was useful enough i guess um but from my understanding that, that it wasn't and that there is a lot a lot more data needed to make these decisions really um there are different surveys being done and we'd like to piggyback onto those rather than reinvent the wheel um and the way in which people describe a bus stop you know that the type of curb this is all new to me obviously but it's been really eye-opening um can be very different mm. um and so we'd want to make sure that we provide the right information um so that journey planners etc can get that from us I see there's a few more questions in the chat now yeah peter uh, well i'm really just trying to the, the point about the the work done for the olympics was that it we in a short period of time managed to get a sort of notional national coverage of this information and it's rather than saying what is accessible because what is accessible is very personal to the individual uh, and their needs uh, but if you focus <laughs> on what is proved to be not accessible because somebody's had a bad experience you've got bad feedback or whatever the ability of a local authority even if they've got only one inquiry or, or one complaint to make sure that complaint is logged and has the appropriate action in every journey planner is the most and quickest most powerful way of getting uh, some very useful information in it will mean that the journey planners will then route uh, people to the next available stop or or, or or another solution. It doesn't necessarily mean that that stop is going to be better, but at least it avoids the problem, which could, it, of course, be a car parking problem. The bus can't get to the curb or all sorts of this, or, or the stop is uh, down a flight of stairs. Anything like this that can um, be just <coughs> mark a stop as being inaccessible is the most efficient way. 
very good uh, apologies i'm as warned at the start i've got to got to drop off now um because uh tim only notified me of this this morning i've got a couple of meetings if it's still going on i'll drop back in um but it really would be have it overrunning by that time um so i'm going to hand you over to Teresa. i don't know how she's going to do it taking the minutes <laughs> and chairing well, we can ask for some volunteers if you like if someone wants to do that <laughs> Uh, no, we'll see how we can do. We might, I might need an eye. Thanks so much, Nick, for Pleasure. doing the first hour. That's really, really helpful. Might see you later. Okay. Bye. Cheerio. Thank ah, you. and as if on time that I see Claire has arrived. Hello, Claire. Hi, Teresa. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thanks very much. We're, we're, we're standing in for Tim today as he's a bit poorly and Nick's just Brilliant. done the first half and um, you arrived in perfect timing because I'm now going to try and chair. Oh, and get the mess and get the messages down as well um, and without slides that's a bit trickier from everyone but um welcome welcome Thank to this you. and I gather you've probably had a chat with Tim and maybe some people know um uh what you're about to say or maybe not all of it otherwise you wouldn't be here but um if you want to do a quick intro and um give yeah, us a I bit of a, a sense of you know sh share what you've got in mind for this session be okay. fantastic um well i think tim said we've only got five or ten minutes i've got carl selby our business analyst who's uh, going to join us as well so i'm the commercial lead for the project now i've got a couple of slides i can either do that or we're, we're quite happy no, no, that's to, great. to talk That'd be through. great. um yeah. so carl is very prompt so he will be here bang on three o'clock <laughs> on every conference <laughs> oh, fantastic that's brilliant um Yes, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll just wait for Carl a couple of minutes if that's OK. Um, yeah. Shall I just try and uh, get the slides up then while that's we're fabulous. waiting for yeah, Carl? Yeah, that would be great. Are you OK to, for, for these to be shared uh, as part of the kind of notes and stuff from this afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Not oh, a problem that's fabulous. Brilliant. OK, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, just, uh, I can. I, I hope others can as well. Fabulous. stuff has carl joined us yet or i'm here yeah ah, hello carl perfect oh, timing there he is <laughs> I well, carl wouldn't be late. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for um giving us a bit of airtime today um and you know thanks to tim and i hope he gets better soon um uh, just to give you a little bit of background before i go into the slides we have only got four it's not death by powerpoints so you'll be pleased to hear <laughs> So how did the concept start? Well, this probably goes back to about 2018, um, where the Rail Data Council and the Rail Supply Group um, kind of recognised that uh, the whole of rail data was very fragmented. And this then further flowed into the uh, William Shapps plan for rail. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the DFT have funded the Rail Data Marketplace project um, with the view that um, it will become cost neutral at the end of the funding. So I think if we take one step back and what is the problem that we're, we're trying to solve here? Um, for anyone that's tried to access rail data, I'm probably uh, teaching to the converted, but rail is a very fragmented ecosystem of providers and it's a mixture of the public and private sectors from network rail, rail delivery group, and then you've got private enterprises um, like the, the train operating companies that, you know, big first group commercial enterprises. Um, there's no clear cross sector view about what data is collected or available um, and gaining to access to data is, is really not straightforward. And we've done a lot of user research in in terms of defining the parameters of this uh, project. Um, and, you know, that's the common thing that we hear. We don't know where, the, where we can find certain data sets. We don't know what the quality is like. Um, and also there's quite a lot of legacy data formats and standards are, are, are very inconsistent. And, and of course, not all data is open. Um, just on, on, on that point, the Rail Data Marketplace is open data by default in terms of, you know, the wider, greater good and, and ultimately to kind of drive innovation is, is the, the key objective here. So in one statement, the Rail Data Marketplace aims to simplify access to rail data and open it up to a wider user base via a single access point with the aim of bringing together data sources and related services from across the industry and beyond. Um, and again, what came through the user research, which was quite interesting, is that we are not a huge data leak or a data aggregator. We are literally a conduit or the key conduit to rail data by exposing APIs, 
Um, and latterly, as we develop the platform, um, flat files, PubSub and other file types to make data accessible. So kind of the business case uh, around this was to access data in real time information. Um, so to lead a better to deliver a better customer journey, a better customer experience through data, through that whole from start of journey to end of journey. And that might also as well be first mile, last mile, um, you know, carbon friendly traveling, getting to the station and beyond the station. Um, it's improving data sharing across operational bodies um, and uh, leads to efficiency. So we will have data sets that are about the customer journey, but equally we've got quite technical engineering type um, data that might drive track condition, uh, maintenance schedules based on data, rather than we always uh, maintain this this um, this fleet every three months. So it's actually based on informed decisions ultimately, which and, and both of the customer experience and the operational efficiencies very much flow into the objectives of uh, Great British Railways, and which is currently the Great British Railways transition team. Um, ultimately, all of this is to, to drive growth to rail. Um, that middle part of the, the journey is the green part of the journey and you know, facilitate that cross-modal public transport. Um, you know, whether that be once you get at the other end, you know, uh, ease of walking. I think, you know, we've all been there. We go to London. We might not be familiar with the route. So we jump on the tube or get into a taxi. You know, if you know London quite well, it might actually be around the corner and quicker to walk or, uh, you know, get get a bike or an e-bike. Um, and it's about stimulating innovation. And Carl will talk to you a bit much a bit more about how the product intends to do that through through the community element of that, bringing uh, sharp minds together, real world use cases to, um, you know, to deliver that innovation. Um, and a lear learning platform, um, you know, for next generation of data professionals where, you know, they can look at what's there. And, and a lot of the user research has been really positive in the sense that a lot of people say, well, I might be a data consumer, but actually um, if I can um, aggregate and maybe overlay with some AI, I might well become a publisher as well. So it will become a circular and a richer platform is the objective as, as this um, develops. So I'll just hand over to Carl. Hi everyone, uh, I'm the product owner on the Rail Data Marketplace. So I'll just talk a bit about some of the functionality features that we see as being important. Um, and also our delivery methods. So we are currently in build with a partner. So we've been running with uh, various iterations of a clickable prototype up till recently. As Claire said, we put that through tons of uh, user research with potential data publishers and data consumers and others within the industry. Um, and but now we're we're on our, our fifth development sprint, so we're working in agile sprints. But broadly speaking, we've got four releases between now and next summer, which take us through a minimum viable product in October, um, and then through sort of private beta, public beta, and it's fully live by the end of next summer. And as we work through that, we'll uh, not only increase the number of users and, and uh, the amount of data sources that are there, but we'll also work our way through the roadmap of these features that you see here. So as Claire said, it's not a data lake. We're not trying to combine and aggregate everybody's data into one big, big data portal. Um, but equally, it's not just a list of links to where data might reside elsewhere. It is a dynamic. API gateway, uh, and then we'll have asynchronous pub sub subscription type models, recognizing that there's still a lot of flat files out in the industry that may not be suitable to convert to APIs, for example. So we're supporting lots of different um, data source types as we move through. And that data catalog will be central to making sure that data is findable and accessible and interoperable and reusable, all that good stuff. But also we see that com the community is going to be extremely important as well. So we want to, um, to create quite a dynamic community. We want to see the industry posting challenges. If there's challenges, industry challenges, perhaps a TOC or a regulator or RSSB or somebody is aware of and thinks should be solvable with the data that's there, but isn't quite sure how, uh, then to have you know, threads within the forum 
for people to discuss that challenge and potentially collaborate or go into competition to try and try and solve it. Things like hackathons and stuff we've got planned with various partners as well. Um, and then the content. So there's, there'll be content management functionality uh, so that we can provide things like user guides, obviously, um, and as well as the contextual help and so on, designing a platform that's easy to use from the ground up anyway. But, um, but we also want that to be fairly rich. And again, the ability for the community, for example, to provide content and to, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, feed into that as well. The data side of it, so the, the data licensing, we've um, got a license builder within the platform. So we understand that at the moment, because it's so fragmented, um, there's quite a lot of friction within that, and you end up with lots of different ad hoc, almost duplicated but bespoke license agreements. When if you want to find data, um, and a particular talk has got it, for example, then you might have to go jump through lots of hoops to get hold of that data. So this is all about standardising that, and the data publishers can answer a series of questions when they publish a data source, and it actually generates then um, a license that's suitable for them and recommends it. And eighty percent of the time, we uh, we're hoping that they will be taken up, but they will be able to uh, publish bespoke licenses if if needed. Let's move on to the, the next slide, Claire. Uh, so the commercial model then, and I'm aware I've only got one minute left, commercial model uh, key principles are we do need to make it attractive for both data publishers and data consumers, um, otherwise nobody's going to use the platform. Uh, and we need to have open and free data by default as laid out in William Shapps, but also we have this this target from DFT to become cost neutral by May 2024. And so we're we're talking to um, to various you know smaller providers and innovators and larger data aggregators and stuff, um, as well as you know even talks that might have fairly specialist data that could be commercially sensitive, but they're happy to share with certain people from certain types of organisations, that kind of thing. So there's quite a lot of control there over who can access your data and how you can potentially commercialise it as well. I talked about the, the, the licence agreement and how we handle that. Um, there's also in, so information for users to assess data value. One of the things that we're really interested in is data quality and not necessarily enforcing minimum quality standards, but providing guidance and again, building into that publish flow in the tool, the ability for publishers to rate um, several key data quality dimensions from the, the DMA dimensions um, and, and state what that sort of declared quality of data is at the point of publication. And then for the users, the consumers through the community to be able to also assess that data source and the quality of the data so you can see um, you've got a bit of a virtuous feedback loop there so that potentially data consumers can improve that data quality as time goes on. And then the final one, yeah, pricing is it, the publisher is completely in control of who can access their data and also how much they charge for it. And we've got various different models um, such as time based, subscription based, but also things like volume based um, pricing as well. And then we handle all of that billing and reconciliation and everything behind the scenes. And I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was pretty impressive within uh, 10 minutes there both of you thanks so much for that um there's probably a lot to take in I know there's been a lot of comments in the in the chat but any questions or discussions for for Carl and Claire straight off oh Becky you've got your hand up I think is that right yeah um so basically it's it's, it's basically the same as what Stephen's saying in the chat Stephen's in my team at, at SYMCA um so basically we've got the tram train in South Yorkshire and it, it essentially it's it's two separate things it, you know it's it's running half on the light rail and half on the heavy rail and um, on the light rail it essentially uses the tram radio for its positioning so we can actually have the real-time location feeding back for displays um, and we managed to um, take da data from Darwin so we were able to predict from the, the train side as well however we've not been able to do that in reverse so it's not until the tram actually enters onto the heavy rail system that it sees where it is and then starts to predict 
um, it's 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 been a problem for a while, but it's coming to a head now because we're having a new stop put in uh, later next year, which is pretty much you know it's not that long after it, it it's it's passed through the cord onto the heavy rail system, um, and so information at that stop is going to be key. The problem we've had it is actually it, it's actually been. Um, talking to somebody at the rail delivery group and actually resolving if it's possible for us to push data into Darwin to say the tram is here on the tram system so that it is actually predicting on the rail side and then obviously on its return journey back from Parkgate it, all that side of things until the tram enters the heavy rail it doesn't know where it is. Mm. Yeah F first thing to say p pushing data into Darwin might be more of a challenge but actually the, uh, the rail data marketplace might be what you need as that sort yeah. of intermediary where you can push data into a centralized location and then you can choose to combine data from different data sources yourself so that might be exactly what's needed you're not the first person to mention trams but not even this week actually <laughs> <laughs> um so claire you've been setting up sort of meetings with the the, to the tox and the fox but um yeah. tram op operating companies have they been on your radar uh, well, no, but we have um, spoken to various people that are trying to do coordinated joined up journeys and they say, you know, it's, it's about another tram organisation, you know, we rely <coughs> on Excel spreadsheets that are manually updated the timetable. Uh, there's no real time running and we have to push those into our system. So I, I think this again, this interoperability and this seamless approach, I think this is something that um, is certainly a concern for people with that joined up geolocation journey. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, is because it's done from the, the tram radio and some of the, the loops on the track, it basically the tram radio is turned off once it meets the heavy rail system. So that's right. just gone. Yeah, um, it, it doesn't, you know, the, the system doesn't know where it is. Um, but it, it's it's it, like I say, it's the fact that there's a, there's going to be a new stop next year. Stagecoach currently uh, operate the, the, the tram. It's actually owned by the MCA in South Yorkshire and actually the concession ends in 2024 um, so it may be we don't know yet but it may be that we actually take over the operation so there's, there's a big tram renewal project going on at the moment and this is one of the key things that's part of that and it's just getting that information that real-time information on the rail side before the, the train the tram actually gets onto the rail side let's say particularly for that first stop OK, if you let Claire know who you've been speaking to at Stagecoach and also who you've been speaking to at RD, uh, sorry, RDG and we'll see if we can help on both yeah. counts. It's, it's a convoluted loop at the moment of how the real time yeah. system works, which is another issue, but we won't go into that. But yeah, um, if, could you Claire, leave your details in the, the chat and I'll get in yeah, touch? Yeah, I will do. Yeah, but Great, that's a classic you. example of that kind of data breakdown, isn't it? You know, yeah. that needs to be resolved by joined up thinking. Yeah. Um, I'll just put my email in the chat. Thank you. Stephen, you've got your hand up. Hey, Stephen, did you? Yep. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. It was just to emphasise what Becky was saying. The biggest challenge we've had is who to contact in the rail delivery group to begin a dialogue with getting information into Darwin. So if you've got any points of contact that would make that easier for us, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, we can certainly ask the question. I mean, um, I'm not that um, I don't know who the main contact for Darwin is, but we could we can ask the question for you. I'll um, email you with some more details and then you've got great. that reminder to, as well to, to have yeah. a look into that for us. Lovely, and thank you. Cheers. So it's data into Darwin. Excellent. That's fabulous. Um, anyone else got any thoughts, questions they want to ask Claire and Carl or things they want to check? So if I can just um, say, so I'm I'm Leon Byford from uh, Transport for London, and you know, Brilliant. just sort of following on from from that previous discussion, you know, one thing that we had been sort of exploring before was trying to get uh, London Underground data into Darwin, um, and you know, we, we sort of found some some issues. Well, you know, it sounds it sounds quite quite difficult uh, to do, um, but you know, this idea of the sort of um, you know the marketplace and and being able to sort of have data in, in one place that that might be a way to you know it would be interesting to see how we can sort of get data from from different you no know, modes you know thing with, with the London Underground you know we do share some of the infrastructure on certain yeah. lines 
with, uh, with with national vows. So um, it'll be interesting to see how how you know what possibility is there. That multimodal story in the first mile, last mile is really important to us, you know, because ultimately if people are able to walk or cycle or, or e-scoot or underground easier as part of a whole journey, then they're more likely to use train, which is, you know, potentially the, the greenest way of travelling uh, for the other bits. So it's very important to us. And we see a lot of, you know, PR and um, and sort of press and media opportunity around that as well. Absolutely. Are there any, uh, I mean, you mentioned you've got your kind of phases going through uh, Carl and Claire between now and kind of next summer. Are there particular opportunities for, I mean, there's been some quite specific things here. Maybe they fit into wider things, but is there, is, is there opportunity for those to feed into some of that? Are, are, there, are there kind of, or, or, or is it really like a closed door and you're just kind of getting on with the plan? <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I mean, throughout, from the start of this process, we have um, engaged um, a wide variety of potential publishers and consumers um, trying to understand what existing challenges there, there are out there. And, you know, within the community element of the platform, this is the, exactly the sort of ideal use case we want to kind of highlight, you know, the people who do consume Darwin, who could equally consume um, the, the tram data and some TFL data and then actually have something that absolutely solves that purpose. And I think just taking one step back as well in terms of the timelines, we are we're in build, as Carl said, we will have minimum viable product um, in October where we've got a user group of 11 different data sets um, and that's across seven different publishers. Um, actually, half of those are commercialised data sets and we've got a, a test pool of consumers to kind of work through the, you know, the flow of the platform, what works, what doesn't. And that we are actively working on a data pipeline as that grows with a view to being public facing beta in around March, April next year. And then we'll have a final deployment of um, final uh, functionality and we will be totally fully live by kind of um, early summer of next year. Um, so throughout that process, we will continue to engage um, with a variety of potential publishers, consumers, um, anyone has kind of a wider interest, um, innovators, data aggregators, um, you know, technical um, people. Um, and, and it's been really helpful today. You know, we, again, it's everything that we've done, we've gone out to community. So even on the contracting, the first iterations, we've talked to all of the publishers in the minimum viable product um, publish set um, and already got their feedback. And we will continue to iterate um, through through those contacts and, and grow that community. Uh, Carl, have you got anything to add on that? Uh, no, spot on. Yeah, so any, anybody really that's on this call that's heard something that interests them, then do, do, do pop us an email and we'll figure out how we can best work with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, I mean, that sounds, Rebecca, it sounds like it's right up your street and you're on it anyway. Um, it sounds like there should be a real opportunity uh, there to, to at least try and tackle some of this. Um, John, Kai, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I mean, it, it strikes me that uh, the public transport market should be becoming more and more integrated. You know, your rail customers are interested in how they get to and from the station. Our people from the local authority side are interested in what the railways are doing to get people that wish to leave our area out of it as efficiently as possible and so on and so on. Um, I, I just, uh, uh, as somebody who was fairly early around in the uh, formation of PTIC, I just wonder if there's not a case that uh, you shouldn't be regular attendees and contributors to this meeting, because there should be a two-way two -way flow of information. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the techniques, I think it is a criticism of the uh, uh, public transport industries in the past, that rail is rail, and buses everything else and even when they were under common ownership they didn't seem to speak that often mm. and maybe you, you know as we approach net zero we've got to damn well make sure that that's going to change 
No, I totally agree with you. And it's that hold joined up. It's like the Holy Grail, the first mile, the last mile and the most carbon neutral journey. You know, and that can also go across to freight as well. You know, yeah. Amazon are mainly um, move that incredible distribution infrastructure that they have got is mainly by road because the, the, the tech that sits within their freight rail can't match their own tech stack. So, you know, there's a massive opportunity there to grow freight as well, you know, during the night and these phenomenal distribution systems, you know. And I think over the last five years, that's that's one industry that has astonished me by how efficient it is, mm. although not green. And there's an opportunity. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely taking your point, John, and, and added it in there. I mean, I'm not quite sure of the how this all came about and Tim might have plans for that anyway. I've no idea, but it certainly sounds like a, 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 you guys might know, Carl and Claire, you might know you're on the <laughs> on the schedule for these going forward, but it certainly sounds like if you were willing, it would be a, yeah, a no, useful. Yeah, we'd definitely be keen to, to join going forward. Yeah. yeah, and we can sort of show the actual platform and stuff if you want as well. It's usually stimulates some good discussion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. That's brilliant. Fantastic. Any other thoughts from anyone else? Any last um, uh, requests or things for Claire and Carl before we move on? No, looks like. Well, your contact there, both, both actually, certainly Claire's contact details are in the chat anyway, if, yeah. you, if you think of things you want to follow up with. Um, so thank you both very much. Lovely to hear about your, uh, hear about the project um, and the plans for this. And Sounds like we might be seeing you again soon. You're welcome to stay, by the way. Um, I, 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 you, you'll be interested. In our next one's about 15 minute neighbourhoods, actually. So, uh, <laughs> um, Dan, I think you, I hope at least, Dan, have you got an update for this? There was a paper, I uh, know. but Well, yeah, so I, 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 I was asked about an hour before this meeting if I could give an update on the paper. So I don't have anything prepared, but I'll talk through the paper. And it's interesting because uh, the, the concept behind us looking at what things are accessible within 15 minutes and so last mile you know first mile across stations actually it was something that's discussed as part of mm -hmm. this so the whole uh, bit of context here is for a few of us after the last PTIC meeting got together and we had an action to create a kind of a uh, it wouldn't be like a one-sided bit of paper but it turned out to be six pages so far um, and so uh, what we're effectively doing is trying to work out you know what what is a 15 minute neighborhood and how can this group kind of help uh, kind of promote that to give kind of very uh, bit of a background so we're saying a 15 minute neighborhood is where uh, you live in an urban area predominantly and what items or what locations or what points are in a 15 minute walk predominantly um to you so we looked at this um a little bit and we worked out you know, typical kind of locations that would be of interest to things like grocery shops train stations uh moby hubs supermarkets schools gyms Pubs came up. Um, everyone wants to be able to walk to a pub, uh, public transport, and car parking um, as well. Um, and so these were kind of thing about predominantly looking at walking and cycling. So public transport wasn't seen as being important so much for this 15 minute aspect, but obviously getting access to the transport or access to the stop was important um, as part of it. Um, and then what we looked at is what sort of data sets uh, would be required to, uh, to utilize this so there's some open data sets out there so OpenStreetMap has uh, some lovely POI data that you can utilize to work out where the gyms are located uh, where the pubs are located and train stations and so on like that uh, and there are premium data sets as well so Ordnance Survey, TomTom, Tom, uh, Foursquare if people remember that back in the day when you could check in and become the king of somewhere where well, they've got an API now where you can you can effectively utilize that data to work out where things are located um, and even the DFT have got some open data sets about the location of schools and hospitals and, and things like that and then the real kind of thing it's been a bit of a theme I think today is then working out well, where can people walk where can people cycle where can people uh, actually uh, yeah, transgress and, and move throughout um, and so this is where we kind of fell over a little bit of knowing what you know what is what's going on so we know that apart from transport not uh, via uh, Ordnance Survey and the Geospatial Commission. There's a lot of work going on around the National Geographical Database. And what it's trying to do is work out for each road, does it have segregated walking, does it have segregated cycling? Um, you know, what is their pavement type? Can people walk on there? Can people cycle on there? But the concern was this will be a premium data set only available to the public sector. Um, so if you, so, uh, so if you're in the private sector or wanted to build an app that utilizes this data, there'll be a charge for it. So that's not really a great way of looking about things. And you've got things as mentioned before, like OpenStreetMap, 
that does have this data, but again, the coverage is iffy. So if you were a national supplier and wanted to do something, it required that manual kind of update to do things um, as well. Um, so it's really looking about how the data could be improved as part of it. Um, and then also looking at things like safe walking routes, using like uh, tying into things like Stats 19 data for accidents, working out are people likely to walk somewhere, is there street lighting there um, and things like that. Um, and then we looked at how it could be done, so what tools could be done, and my bias is we have a tool that, that has been used for this, and there's a couple of case studies that's been done, which is why I've looked into it. But then at Passenger, I've got an ISO growing tool as well that can kind of show which area can be covered um, as well, and other GIS packages. Um, and also, uh, even the DFT uh, have got their national geodime statistics, and this gives information uh, every year about for each output area. So um, I don't know how many of them are, 180,000 in the UK. It gives their average walk time, public transport time, cycle time to some of them POIs as well. So there's some work that's already going on um, in that front. Um, and then it came down to about the policy um, about and how this should be done. So what is the what is the real kind of need for 15 minute neighbourhoods? And uh, prior to this paper coming out, the levelling up was a big a big aspect of things. So working out which areas maybe uh, weren't accessible, uh, how the levelling up agenda could be utilised as part of that. But as I understand things from the last week, levelling up is uh, not quite so high on this. Down, no? <laughs> it's, it's, it's gone down the priority list. Um, and then who's in charge of making it? Is it a local authority thing? Um, and so that's where the levelling up fund was going to come in, where local authorities could apply for funding potentially to improve active travel, create low traffic neighbourhoods that were uh, in traffic calming measures to kind of promote the kind of active travel um, side of things as well um, as part of it. Um, and then yeah, there's some kind of examples um, at the back of, of where it's worked quite well. So WSP did something um, that was a uh, really good kind of use uh, called Kidbrook Village, uh, development of old council estate that's very much focused on having things on your doorstep um, as well. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of where we got to. So we're kind of, the paper I think has been circulated, we're up for kind of any comments that are kind of coming back on there. And I think we've kind of realised it's gone a bit more away from a public transport usage and is it useful continuing it as part of this group um, or not um, is another kind of open question that Tim wanted me to ask to ask today um, as well. Um, and the other thing is uh, that came out is you know you could build the best kind of system um, in the world that promotes walking and cycling but um, how do you force people to that modal shift? So you know, we've came across lots of examples where a journey could be walked in 15 minutes, but someone would still drive because there was parking there, it was free parking, they weren't penalised for driving at all. How do you actually force that modal shift? And marketing isn't enough, so you need to mandate it in, in some kind of way. It's interesting seeing, um, is it the Charter Institute or, uh, no, it was one of the charities came out over a white paper this week um, that kind of looked at, uh, how you could tax vehicles differently and removing kind of vehicle excise duty and replacing it with like a, a distance based pricing model and that's come around quite a few times that kind of sector it's looking at different ways in which you can you know tempt people out of the car and to do to do different modes and um, as part of it um, and yes yeah, so I think I think that was it um, really so yeah I'd for any kind of comments or, or anything like that and please feel free to feedback on the paper that was shared in the in the in the meeting by Tim Fabulous. That's brilliant. Thanks. That was a great canter through, Dan. And I guess you sound pretty informed, so I think you must have been part of the, <laughs> part of indeed, the meeting yeah. as well. Um, John, you've got your hand up. Do you want to kick us off? Oh, you're on mute, though. <laughs> oh, dogs and tricks again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I would just say that a 20 minute neighbourhood or a 15 minute neighbourhood will be the same as any other economic unit. It will have a hinterland as well. Further than that, I'd say that don't regard public transport as non-active travel. Because first of all, there's the role in accessibility for people that are less able to move themselves around. Um, and secondly, you know, if you went but the centroid of the 15, 20 minute neighbourhood, you're talking about a seven and a half minute to 10 minute travel time. And that is quite a distance for many a bus traveller. So I think you've got to regard it either as bus is part of active travel, which is the way I would look at it, or it's active travel plus bus 
and you know continuing to treat them as different modes which i i think is increasingly uh, not a sustainable answer so I, i'd urge two things first of all i think it is very much the case that uh, this group should continue to take an interest in it because one of the things that makes places like kidbrook work is that there is good information and by information, I mean signage on the ground as much as anything else. Um, you, 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 you know, it, its design is inbuilt from the start. Mm. Um, and that includes information as much as the physical aspects of the design. So I'd say we carry on with this and uh, let's see what Tim thinks in due course. <laughs> It's quite interesting point. So I think on new bills, say like a national planning policy framework and things like that, is for having that kind of gear up towards new development. I think there's a real kind of you know there's a need there, and you can legislate quite a bit around new development. But how do you retrofit it into a community that doesn't have it at the moment? I think that's one of the one of the, the big questions. And who pays to to fix it? You know, which funds are available? There used to be an actual travel fund you could utilise. There used to be a levelling up fund. Uh, you know, where who, yeah. who's going to pay for it? And who's going to do it? I think is a is another question that uh, we need to try and get to the bottom of. Uh, and you look at the expected release of land zoned for hiding housing <laughs> under the um, present government, we have got somehow to ensure that those which to themselves may well look very much like 15, 20 minute settlements, we've got to make sure that actually they're well connected to the rest of the network. Exactly Otherwise, right. you'll just induce more long distance car travel. It should be I, on the rail. I think that's why one of the, the two key locations where for longer distance rail is important because that's a real kind of connectivity into do that longer distance. And yeah, bus stops was another thing that yeah. you have access to bus stops uh, within that 15 minutes as well. And wide enough roads between them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or no parking on them. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Rebecca, Becky, you've got your hand up. Do you want to add to? Yeah, I can't help but comment, can I really? Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I can see how um, this is abuse and works in, it, certainly in the larger sort of metropolitan areas. I mean, I personally live in a reasonably low uh, rural area, so literally I, I do have to walk 15 minutes to get to anything. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, it's all 15 minutes away from me. Um, but, um, you know, obviously, I, I, I don't think we can just ignore car use at all, because obviously, you know, you're not going to carry your shopping 15 minutes <laughs> back, you know, could be quite heavy. Um, but also, um, you know, moving into sort of the, the Sheffield area, which is where I actually work, um, you know, there's a lot of um, um, districts and, and local areas in, in Sheffield where, <sighs> You know, it, it's still a large area. There are areas of, of you know, shops and, and pubs and things, but there are also areas that don't because particularly now you are seeing a lot of these things closing down. There's a lot of pubs closing down, a lot of shops closing down. So, you know, it, 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 it I think we just have to be careful because it might be something that we're saying it's there, it's 15 minutes away, but it's not because with the situation the economy is at the moment it kind of might not be there anymore um but yeah it's just just changing i think it's yeah things are changing and i think it's yeah it, it's it's those larger areas i think where you do then have these sort of more localized sort of local areas where you have got a congregation of all these places together where people are going to 15 minutes away however they get there um but yeah in the, in the smaller areas it's not quite as relevant it's, it's really interesting when the DFT last released their uh, journey time statistics, they showed a disparity between urban and rural areas. And on average, the, and uh, to get to their uh, five uh, like education, supermarkets, um, education, supermarkets, healthcare, um, and there's something else uh, in in the yeah, kind of rural areas, the average journey was over twice as much. Um, and so, yeah, in, uh, it really showed that disparity where things yeah. like 15 minute cities wouldn't work in that kind of area. But they've got much more reliant on car transport and car travel. Um, and yeah, maybe 
bus routes. But then, you know, as you say, POIs are changing, the locations are changing yeah. all the time, and bus routes are changing all the time as oh, well. You know, like they're, they're, being, <laughs> they're being they're being cut left, right, and centre, and being you know replaced with demand responsive transport or flexibly routed services that aren't actually documented in anywhere near the same level of detail. So it's hard to get information out to people that maybe you could do a dial a minibus service that could actually get you to that location, but that's not centrally managed in a way. But that's that's a that's a conversation for another time. But yeah, it's it's all about uh, yeah maintaining that and not doing it as a one-off. It's a forever moving kind of goalpost that yeah, you know, changes and ebbs and flows. Definitely is. I mean, I'm I'm quite lucky that the fact that I have got a lot of these um, you know facilities available. They're all 15 minutes away, but they're all they're all sort of quite available. Apart from a train station, I don't have one of those. Um, but you know, it, it was like I say with the buses as well. We nearly lost the bus that actually went into Sheffield, so that would have been us pretty much cut off. Um, luckily, the uh, the uh, council did actually uh, um, save it quickly. I think there was a, a few uh, scared people about that. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a moving picture, isn't it? Yeah, John, you. Sorry, did I cut you off earlier, John? No. Oh, adding. Anything else you want to add there? Uh, or is no, your I'd, hand up from... I'd, I'd right. just reinforce the fact that what Rebecca said, I mean, nobody is saying that cars are not useful. They are, particularly if you're making a journey that only you want to make at that particular time. And, you know, I don't mean that you've just felt like making it and haven't looked at what the alternatives are. There genuinely no, is no alternative. But... In terms of a proper 20 minute community, Rebecca should walk in roughly the same direction for <laughs> all of the activities she wants to engage in, rather than go out and the 15 minute community is, is spread round the circumference of a circle. Sorry, do I mean the circumference? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, you, you know, yes, all these things come into it. But again, I, I stress the, the 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 fact that information has a very important part to play. Yeah. Peter, did I see your hand up? Oh, there he is. Well, well, yes, it, it's it's just uh, the, the it's it's in the title about this fifteen minutes. So, but I mean, time isn't everything in this case. It, it's it's often to do with the quality of the the local environment, and I think that the comments about the you know about whether the pavements are available and their width and that sort of thing really uh, to me this comes down to what i've said for a long time about the need a much better focus on the quality of the pave of the walking surfaces and um, I, I do take a sort of interest as i as i go into different places and realize what variability there is around how the pavements are maintained and 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 managed in terms of whether the parking is on them or not um and uh um i i mean as, as somebody who you know has when I was frequently visiting cambridge wonderful cycling city and whatever but actually <laughs> their pavements are appalling if you're a pedestrian walking in cambridge i would say the pavements are some of the worst in the country so i think i think it comes back we do actually need somebody to be a better champion uh, for um, the pavement quality and in some respects that allies very well with with bus use because every bus user becomes a pavement pavement user. I'd be happy to reach out to because uh, I'm doing some work with Ordnance Survey at the moment uh, and I could reach out maybe in the next PT suggest to Tim that someone talks about the National Geographical database and what they're collecting in regards to pavement quality and street lighting and things like that because it seems to tie into a few different things that have been have been commented on today. So I'm happy to reach out if that's agreeable to people. Yeah. Sounds really helpful. I think Dan sounds great. That's brilliant. Julie, you've popped up on my screen. Are you ready or are you going to add to that? <laughs> I'm just ready when you're ready. Excellent. <laughs> In which case, uh, Dan, that sounds like a great action to move forward from from that one. And we'll, we'll note that and, and kind of take that forward. And obviously it sounds like the conversation is still ongoing with that group as well. So if people want to get involved, that's fantastic. Um, so, Julie, yeah, over to you. Travel line update from you yourself this time, which is great. OK, thank you, Teresa. I'm going to do um, travel line and plus bus because we are multimodal um, and we manage both brands. So um, it links in pretty nicely to what everybody else has been saying about integrated transport, 15 minute cities and having all the data in one place. 
So um, I'll start with the progress we're making on taking data from BODS to integrate it into the TNDS. So we have our Traveline national data set. We get the majority of the data from local authorities, with the exception of first group and stagecoach, and we get it direct from them. And that's the data set we publish out to Google and other organisations to use, um, and we publish three or four times a week. We are we have been working with Basemap, our provider, and we now have an automated way of downloading data from BODS and integrating it with the TNDS. Um, we are ready to go live with that um, as soon as our bus operator partners are ready. Um, and so far, we have first group who will be going live with this in November. None of the other bus operators we've spoken to feel that their data is ready yet um, to go live on BODS because therefore it goes into Google and they prefer to wait until the new year before we start publishing their data. I mean, I think that's a pretty important indicator of how ready the data on BODS is. I know that some, Google already takes data for some of the um, big operators direct from BODS and we've been having some feedback particularly this week I don't know if it's just started happening that that's not always correct um, so so we're waiting until our stakeholder partners have told us they know their data is good to go before we do that so that's just a small thing um, some of the other things we're doing as part of that piece of work is creating a uh, a report that tells you what's in BODS and what's in TNDS and compares the two so for the first time that gives us a separate look at what available on BODS and, and what isn't. Um, straight away, we know there probably won't be any rural Scottish or Welsh data, only the groups. And we know to start with, there won't be trams and there won't be ferries, which is in the TNDS. And when we publish the TNDS, we'll have a data report that gives you the data source for each of those. So for every single service in there, you'll be able to see um, which the data source was, whether it was local authority, BODS, or direct from the operator. So the TNDS will continue to be published as a single file per service, even where on BODS the operator publishes several files for a service and splits it out into timetables, we will put it back into one file per service or one file per line, which is the way that our TNGS users are used to consuming the data, so they don't have to change their system. So we call that flattening the files, if you like. We're not changing anything, we are just putting them into one file from, from multiple files. Um, one of the um, other um, reports we're adding is we, we, we found some data in BODS for Trans Exchange where operators have got overlapping periods of operation. So they may have accidentally put an early start date on one of their bits of data, so they overlap, which means the timetables run in parallel for a week when they shouldn't. And we've added a report for that. That's not in the BODS reporting at the moment. And in the same way, we find data that's got a gap where they've They've put a late start date on by accident, they've got a gap of a week. So we're doing some reporting against that so that we can begin to run the two systems in parallel. We have the BODS data in a test journey plan and we can start talking to those operators about those gaps and working out how can we can make sure they don't happen again or we can at least mitigate for them. The biggest challenge we have at the moment with BODS data is block number. So most of you on this call will be aware that a block number is something that says this is what the bus is doing today um, and this is the schedule that it's on. And this is not mandatory in Trans Exchange PTI, but it is one of the quality checks that BODS makes. So operators, if they want to have 100% quality on BODS, they have to include the block number in their data. Now, the block number is not available until probably one to two weeks before the data goes live because it's driver's hours, it has to go past management, it has to go past the unions and it's very last minute data. And then on the other hand, we've got our customers who want to start journey planning for half term for Christmas and we can't do that with BODS data because there isn't a 42 day look ahead. So we're, we're trying to work with BODS to, to understand how as um, information providers, as a journey planner provider, we can give a 42 day look ahead with data that only has two weeks and um, because it's just the two things don't work. So um, requiring block number means you can't have a 42 day look ahead. And that's a fact. Um, we've got to find out a way to work around that. And um, we've been working with Becky and SYPT to look at ways of getting data direct from some of the operators so that we can circum we, we, can, we can kind of cut that phase out and get the data before it has a block number put in and gets published to BODS. But kind of that's not what we should be doing. BODS should have all the data in it. The statutory instrument says that operators have to provide a 42 day look ahead for standard registrations, but they can't. Uh, they can't meet that reg regulation if the if the standard the BOD standard says you've got to have a block number in it. And that's that piece of data that um, John was referring to earlier that helps you to match together your journeys for real time. It's not the only way of doing it, but it's one of the ways. So we're, we're, we're kind of grappling with that a bit at the moment. Um, so moving on to um, more positive things, we are looking at um, redeveloping our data website so that it's easier to use, um, having far better ways of reporting where we've got issues with data, where you've all reported issues with data so that 
open data community can self-serve and we don't have the same question 10, 20, 30 times. Also, the operators can then look at that and say, ah, that's our data. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of um, converting the TNDS into a GTF data set, GTFS data set, because there's a huge demand for it. And because not all of the data is yet on BODS to be able to do that, we've been asked about it. So we may, we may do that as well. Um, we've been talking to the RDM team, so it's good to see um, Claire on here talking and, and Carl talking about that. Um, we would like to publish the Traveline National data set to, bot, to the rail, rail digital marketplace so that um, TOCs and um, local authorities and everybody can access it from there. Um, the next nat nat natural step for us of that is also publishing plus bus data. So plus bus is, um, is a rail ticket that you can use on a bus and not a train. So it's the ultimate in integrated transport. You buy it from one system, you use it on another. Um, so we can't yet put it into NetX. NetX has got a bit of development to do before you can express a, a plus bus fare in NetX. Um, so we will put it up as a table. So we'll put the fares up, we'll put the availability of all the ticket types at the different locations up there and we'll put, we now have a database of locations and zones, so they'll go up as well. So all of the open data that we're able to publish on on bus, on, on tram, on ferry and, and on plus bus tickets will be put on the rail digital marketplace for everybody to access. So that kind of moves us on to thinking about, well, if we can do plus bus, um, why don't we start thinking about, and we'll be putting those plus bus zones and fares onto our own journey planner. Um, and if we can do that, we've got the technology to put on multi-operator tickets. So before um, BOD started, we had a project that we've paid for already um, that displays um, multi-operator tickets on our journey planner and provides the price uh, and draws the zone. Um, we stopped paying the revenue for that, the revenue cost for that, because the operators were developing NetEx. Um, NetEx has taken a bit longer than perhaps we expected and has some way to go. So we're considering revisiting our project on fares to restart that revenue cost and to be collecting those data in just very simple tables. So you would have a very simple table to explain the operator name, the NOC, the name of the product. It would have a zone attached to it that we would develop a tool for um, and you'd be able to display that. And I don't see any reason why we couldn't make that data open as well. We just can't put it into NetEx yet. So that might be another really good use for the rail digital marketplace. And of course, that's a good news story for all of us because it's not just William Shapps that says plus bus needs to be encouraged and integrated transport needs to be encouraged. It's also in the national bus strategy. So we think in many ways there's a quick win here for lots of people, not just our customers, lots of um, BSIPs um, monies that have been awarded to try and encourage this. And we think if we can do it in one place in the, in the best way possible and that can be reused and that might be the best use of all of our time. So we've got about 340 stakeholders in Plus Bus as individual bus operators, TOCs um, and rail retailers to work with on that. So it's quite a, it's a big project um, to say the least. We have now got the Plus Bus e-ticketing standard published. So that went, it was published in ASSIST, which is um, the RDG ticketing manual, um, I think it was two weeks ago. So that's gone through its final um, governance and it's ready to, to use. So the, the rail retailers can now take that data and, and build rail tickets um, that can be sold for use on Plus Bus. Um, and the next um, part of that project for us is updating our bus driver training materials to ensure that all the bus operators can recognise those new ticket designs. Um, and then we literally switch on a station at a time within the plus bus zones where we want them to go live. So for each of the 280 plus bus um, stations, we need to make sure that all of the bus operators know it's happening and recognise the tickets, that all of the TOCs know it's happening and the, the rail, rail retailers are ready and that we've updated our Plus Bus website to tell our customers, which in, in itself informs the um, knowledge base within National Rail Inquiries. So um, it's a fairly complex project, but one which we're quite looking forward to um, actually going live with, having spent you know a year and a half um, developing the product. Futures for Plus Bus looks a bit like developing bigger products called things like Plus Bus Explore, where you might have a, a local area like Cornwall Explore, where you have a rail, a rail ticket holder who can access a, a Cornwall wide ticket. It's not going to be that different to the Cornwall wide tickets that are available now, but it will be presented to somebody who has a rail ticket. So you're you're encouraging, our car was talking about this earlier, you're encouraging your rail passenger to get off the train and not get into a car, but to get onto public transport or to, or to, to find another way of, of using the road network. Um, so we're quite excited about that. Other thoughts we're having are that Plus Bus, although it's a rail product, it's our brand and you could have Plus Bus 
associated with other things such as we talked about healthy and active walking we could talk about um accessing venues with 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 discounted tickets etc so we're thinking about other ways we can use plus bus um as a product without it always having to be that rail ticket by slightly altering the logo and, and having the same name so it, it would give you the ability to use some of your multi-operator tickets either on rail or bus that are existing to use that same nationally recognized branding um, we are still considering fares we're drafting a fares discovery paper which looks at the work that's been done on netex um, and it looks at um, a lot of research we have done by transport focus that tell us our customers want to know how much it costs to get on a bus I mean, it's not rocket science. We all know that we've been talking about that for 22 years, 24 years. We still can't do it. So we are wondering how long we have to wait to be able to interpret Netix data before we think, well, we've already designed this product that you can collect it in a different way. Perhaps we ought to be doing that in the interim so that at least we can tell them how much a metro ticket is, how much a TFGM ticket is and how much um, the other generic kind of um, ones around are where they're multi operator. We think we can achieve that in fairly short time scales. Um, and I think a final piece of news, let me just check my notes, is that we have a new full time staff member starting next week. So um, Mike Nolan will be joining us from the West Yorkshire Combined Authority as our customer experience manager. So he'll be picking up um, ownership of the Travel Line journey planning product. He will be developing conversations with local authorities around BSIPs and how we can all try to achieve more um, with what we've got. That, centrally is travel line which is we, we think that's a joint resource and we're not for profit and he'll be working with me on plus bus and, and taking forward some of our other um, projects such as good journeys and some of these futures um, that we've been talking about then we'll be four full-time people we should be able to do much more than we've been able to do for now so i think that's it rattled it through but um that's a lot any questions yeah. Not a question, but um, that thank you for proving our wild claims earlier that we're talking to <laughs> lots of stakeholders in multimodal organisations. <laughs> You're welcome. Rob, you've got oh one oh I oh I don't know. Go, I think Rob had his hand up first. Go for it. <laughs> Free for all. Um, yeah, firstly, that's fantastic news. Thanks, Julie. There's loads of information there, and it's all very exciting. Um, the, the reason that I put my hand up actually was the discussion about um, block codes in Trans Exchange. Um, perhaps it's worth having a conversation offline about that. Um, but another problem with block codes generally is that smaller operators don't even use that concept in their day to day okay. work at all um, yes. in a lot of cases. And so when I've been acting as an agent for for BODs for, for smaller operators, I've in effect had to make them up, um, which is, is perhaps not ideal, but it gets you a, a higher quality score on BODs. And I'm under pressure perhaps from smaller operators to do that for them. But I'm then very well aware that what you're seeing in BOD's timetable data is not going to match what comes through from a ticket machine. Um, and that's because the operator has no concept of what yeah. a block actually is. Um, but yes, as I say, perhaps it's one to take offline. Um, yeah, I agree. And I mean, certain, some of the work Tim did early on about how you can match without a block reference number, we already use that. We already take data from local authorities on real time in Siri and we match it to the TNDS and we use a fuzzy search of the National Operator Code, the time the bus left the stop in the morning, um, the, the line number, and we have kind of put it together like that. And, it, and it, we've been using that for 13 years. It's not perfect, but it's data that's available in both feeds consistently and we get it updated every day. So uh, there are other ways around it. And at the moment, something like um, 50 or 60 percent of the data on BODs is missing a block reference number. So you can't use it anyway for cross journey referencing. Um, we can also see that, um, which I forgot to mention, um, when you look at what's in BODs and what's in the TNDS, there's about 50% that's not in BODs and is in our data, 50%. Um, so um, we're still trying to work out exactly how we explain that that's missing. A lot of it's Scottish and Welsh data, but other data is not. And we're measuring it each week so we can see how that changes from week to week. And we can see data dropping off and coming back on again. Um, so we can see there's not that consistency. So, yes, it would be really helpful, Rob, to have that um, have that conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. I don't know who was next. Uh, uh, Becky, I think. <laughs> oh, you're on mute though, Becky. My turn. Eh? Um, yeah, it's just a quick one, really. Um, I would say just, you know, um, obviously, yeah, Julie, we've had those conversations, haven't we, about block, yeah. num a block number. Um, and it, it really looks like, you know, 
it's a it's a local solution which isn't really you know a solution because you're taking the data nationally so it needs to be you know directed to higher up the chain um I mean, I was just wondering if, if because it's inconsistent anyway, or, or especially with the smaller operators not providing that anyway within BODS, is it something where perhaps, yes, it's it's a requirement, should it be available, but at that 42 day point where, you know, data, it, the data deadline actually is in, in BODS, could it be that it doesn't have to be in there at that point and then when it is available the operators are able to actually overwrite that and provide it at a later date because if it, it, it's not mm. required for journey planning but yeah. it is required for well depending on the system required for, for real time and real time is something that's sorted out a, 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 you know much closer yes. to the, the live um, release of the service. Yeah I mean I completely agree with you it's just working out because at the moment BODS does a, a data trans exchange validation it doesn't fail the validation if it, if it hasn't got block number it passes it it fails if you like the quality test so it still gets published but it's got a low quality score because it doesn't have a block number in it and as soon as you're a if you're a newbie data consumer and you go to one of the big groups data and it says it's only 70 percent qual data quality it doesn't look great it's got a red light not a green one so you can see why it's important for bus operators to have a good news story about their data but i totally agree if there was some way of um bods i mean there should be it's cost a lot of money it's not a difficult thing to measure data twice is it it's just where yeah. you put that check i mean i say that it's easy for me to say that i'm not employed by dft um <laughs> but if I you mean, can check if you can check it in a, a, a later date to make sure it's there before the real time's ready and make sure it's in, a, in a, if the data's going to go live in two weeks time maybe that's where you make the check for for the, otherwise yeah. you're going to miss out on these 42 day uploads but at the same time our bus operators don't want to be submitting this data twice you know it's a huge workload for them already to submit data to boards and then we start looking at netx and getting siri right they just want to put it up once and not have to do it again so if you'll talk to we've, we've talked to first group about this and stagecoach at senior level and a technical level and it's a big piece of work to have to submit it twice so perhaps then you go back to look at registration reform so the dft are going to start looking at bus registration reform and is block number going to go in there? It can't possibly go in there because that's not part of the registration because it's too far ahead. But maybe that's where we had to start taking data from that hasn't got a block reference in. But once you've got that in place, why would we use BODS? Because we've got the registration system. So it's something that we need to discuss a bit yeah. further. And I think the DFT are open to conversations about this and they want to make it work, which is, I think, important. Yeah, because I mean, if, if ultimately, you know, BODS came about to, you know, provide um, you know, better information to customers, you know, improved journey planning out there. So customers have got better access to information. Yet because of that, actually, the, their look ahead is dramatically reduced. It's kind of having the opposite effect. Yeah. Mark, you've appeared. I'm, I know Mike and John have got their hand up, but I'm guessing you were following on with this. Yeah, I, yeah I'm just uh, responding to the um, registration reform question, I guess, because um, yeah, it's every week it's, uh, it gets mentioned. It got mentioned at 10 o'clock on Monday this week. It's uh, every week goes by and it's something that I'm pushing for more dialogue and more uh, conversations around registration reform because it, it will resolve so many of these types of questions and queries about how data is presented. Um, and taking Julie's point about operators only wanting to submit, the, submit data once is really valuable um, and something that, yeah, we're totally aware of. Um, it's an ongoing project uh, to try and get that um, project started. Really, it doesn't particularly sit with us within the BODS team. It sits elsewhere, but um, our voice um, is being heard about trying to get this moving. Yeah. We'll get in touch with you. I don't want to take time here, but we'll get in touch with you because the experience in, in Hearts and other stuff trying to get around this, as I'm sure Becky and others and, and Julie's trying to do as well. I mean, we've been trying to use journey code to do it and trying to match between the schedule and the uh, Siri VM and the and the TXE from the operators. Um, it is slow work. It's kind of working, but it, it still involves changing <laughs> systems. It's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it, it's another attempt at trying to get this to work and, and kind of cross between the registration and the and, and, and the um, you know the, the kind of plan and then the live, which is quite tricky. Um, we are close to time. John, John, and Mike, you had your hands up on this. You want to add in some thoughts on this one? Can, can I just? say julie that, that that was a great presentation i don't know about 20 years we've been talking about a number of products that you included in that that are now available 
that we've probably been talking about for nearly 30 years in West Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> but the big question that uh, concerns me is you've talked about first and stagecoach quite a lot. There's a couple or well, were at the start of this meeting of other big groups that we're not hearing too much about. But beyond that, there's a very large number of operators providing essential services that are barely getting a mention in this sort of meeting. Are they actually getting represented on the database and are they getting the services they want? out of BODS, travel line, any other supposedly national service. I mean, this is what we're trying to find out. Certainly all of the data in TNDS is everything our local authorities send us. Um, so we expect that to be every single operator. And it looks like most of the operators are there. We can check against OTC and we've got really good compliance. What we can't tell is exactly how many services there should be, um, but we have to rely on the good work of the local authorities to get that right. Um, we have very low complaints about missing data. It's more about timetables that have changed, short notice or or drivers shortages and cancellations. Um, we do engage with all of the groups and Album. So I sit on the Album MDs group. Um, we, in terms of how we prioritise data for Traveline, we have um, a custom report in Google Analytics that records how many of our customers ask for journeys about which operator. So when they do a journey plan or a timetable lookup, we log that and we analyse it and we can see our top 20 operators by demand. And we are prioritising it by our customer demand because we're customer driven. So we might say that um, first group is not, some of the groups are not the top operators. We've got Warrington Transport, you've got Trent Barton, you've got organisations like that who are independent or council run who have huge hits on our website and we need to be starting to use their data too. So we've, we've always gone by um, the principle of, of um, going through the big groups first because they are represented on our board and we can talk to their, their people direct. They've got a national member of staff that deals with it. But then the next people that we, we, we take Nottingham City Transport already, we take Re Reading buses already. But the the time it takes to engage with those other operators on a technical one is will become available once we've got an extra member of staff so we can knock off the list of who's ready to publish their data. Because there's one thing saying, yes, we're ready for BODS, um, but there's another thing them going, oh, yes, we're ready for this to go live on Google. And how how willing some of those operators are to say, actually, we're not ready is, is the story, isn't it? Um, we're not ready. The data's up there, but it's not good enough. It's a difficult message to put across that not many people want to be heard. Um, and it's not always because of standards. There are many reasons, as you understand, why people don't complete their data on time. So it's it's a kind of case by case one. But yes, we are including all the bigger operators and we are managing it by demand on our website for, for those operator services. Thanks. Fantastic. I'm conscious of time for people that um, uh, might need to leave soon. I, what I'm suggesting, there's not a lot more to cover, actually, apart from Peter and his the, the issue log. Um, Tim, I suggest we carry this on, but we just finished the, the last two items, which I think should be quite quick. And then if there are other bits, to people can stay on if they've got time. So the EU standards development. Um, Tim has popped paper up on the website with updates on that. He's, he's basically said there's, there's not really many other updates other than that. Um, so, Siri parts one to Five, I think it's pretty much the same. They're still expecting it to be published. Expect to take another few weeks, interestingly. Um, it's been updated for a couple of years. So it's, just, it's been oh okay, part two has been approved for publishing. Expected to take another few weeks for, for the Siri part. For Siri part six, control actions. Um, this will enable the exchange of information on control actions as managed by operators whilst operating mobility services. Um, a control action, a decision made about the management of the operation of a transport system, for example, to cancel a route or a planned journey. Some decisions are typically made by controllers in the control room, but may also be made automatically by monitoring processes. Um, so the existing Siri Situation Exchange Service provides a comprehensive description of events, disruptions, as well as general purpose information, but it's specifically dedicated to the exchange of messages for passenger information. 
so it, uh, for, furthermore, control actions are purely internal and don't have an external cause or consequence situation. So it sounds like it's a, just a kind of update of progress on that. I suggest if you're interested in that, you have a look on the on the paper on the web. He says there isn't much, but there's actually quite a bit here. <laughs> um, so on Siri, the real time European profile part seven. It's been completed in a waiting SEN approvals process, which could take up to a year. OK, so we're waiting a time for that. Um, and the European minimum profile outlines minimum fields and rules for data, rules for expectations of the ITS directive. OK, alternative modes. OK, so on NetEx alternative modes, the alternative modes exchange format has been published and it covers the exchanges of data for alternative transport modes, including cycle sharing, car pooling and rental. Um, the accessibility profile for NetEx um, it describes how to extend the European passenger information profile with additional information. Uh, what's the latest on this one? Sorry, I'm being a bit dense here. I'm trying to read and talk to you at the same time. Uh, minimum documentation. OK, so the documentation on the accessibility profile, uh, the documentation has been completed and is awaiting SEN approvals, which again, not a typical story, might take quite a while. And then on vehicle data from in time, not sure what that is. On vehicle information, I think it's includes data about performance, range, faults, etc. This will provide vehicle operational data in real time on vehicles and not in a manufacturer back office. In time, these will be turned into CEN and BSI standards. OK, so it sounds like it's work in progress. And then public <laughs> transport, road vehicle scheduling and control systems, number of updates to the physical layer of the network to support gigabit Ethernet. And then new parts of the standard are being discussed, including automatic passenger counting and MQTT. I'm sorry, that's not very eloquent. Tim would do a much better job. But if those, any of those things are of interest, do have a look at that paper, which is linked. Um, and then the, it, Peter, are you still with us? You may have left. You are. Um, I'm here. OK, you've <laughs> raised you. a, an issue, I think, Peter. Maybe not just yes. you. T Tim tells me it's issue 100. So there we oh, are. Celebration. Um, but um, in, in fact, talking with Tim, we're, we're, we don't know how whether to manage it, but he was talking about tomorrow about we're issuing the um, um guidance for the christmas new year timetables it's something we we sort of worked on last year and it, people felt it was quite helpful to have a little guide that was updated for the respective days and um one is, is ready to go um but each time you look at it uh, do, there's a bit of discussion around just the way that the christmas eve and new year's eve have been um handled in the profile so this this isn't something coming from um the eto developers or anything this is just just very much for us as users of the data and a discussion to put to you um the, the it's very good that the bank holidays have got more um profile prof more coverage in the profile and the, they're coming through better more rigor and of course the idea was to put christmas eve and new year's eve in with that sort of general principle of bank holiday coding they are different of course in the way that public transport operates because whereas a bank holiday is normally a timetable uh, usually for the for the bank holiday um or or the the sunday timetable or whatever um christmas eve and new year's eve well, the journeys that will run on those days will follow the day of the week. So th th this year, the Christmas Eve is on the Saturday. So you'd expect it's Saturday journeys that will run um, uh, actually on the day. 
um, and therefore it's not quite the same as a normal bank holiday. The, the problem we've had then is when people have coded them up in the future that for um, the operation, we've got quite a few bits of data coming through, whereas on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, we have not only the, the Saturday service say running this year, but we'd find that the whole of the Monday to Friday service is deemed to be running as well because of the way people have not adjusted their coding. So this actually this proposal and if, if you if those who want to study it and think about it um, if in fact the guidance was slightly changed so that the it was the, the only coded the journeys as not running then of course you could code the data up in perpetuity a perpetual timetable you would code all the evening journeys on the monday to friday and the saturday and the Sunday timetables as not running if that was your practice for Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve and you would be able to leave them from year to year and that is the big advantage of, of this slight adjustment to the approach. You would not have to do what you need to do at the moment is actually change the data each year to say which of the day of the week will be running this um, this Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. So that's the basis of this of this change. We've just logged it really in the issues to just try and see if anybody wanted to pick it up for a bit of discussion and see any problems with it. And that's, so it's there, but it's not for this year, by the way. Um, it's uh, we carry on. Um, uh, will it'll be for for will be for a, a change in the future. That's fabulous. Thanks so much, Peter. Has anyone got any questions or thoughts on that? issue at the moment they want to raise with Peter. David. I'd, I'd agree with Peter, it's a nightmare. We've been telling KPMG it would be for several things. It will be for the next two years uh, and then it will be back for a run on Monday to Friday for a little while. But the other problem we're having at the minute with BODS is that a lot of the systems cannot produce a bank Boxing Day holiday date this year because there is no Boxing Day holiday and BODS is validating for it. And we've wow. now got a position where data is being taken off of BODS if it fails that validation. And so some of the data that's previously got through has been taken off recently. Um, and we're now working with about 40 operators to try and get some of their data back on. So it's all sort of mixed Thanks. up in the same bit. Sounds a bit of a man. <laughs> I'll maybe have a discussion. That, that's with you. why we need travel line. <laughs> <laughs> maybe have a discussion with you, David, a bit, bit more about that offline um, to see what we can do, because uh, it shouldn't have that effect. But if it is, we can we can work on that for you. Well, we definitely TF. Um, Greater Manchester, TFGM, they cannot put Boxing Day holiday in their software. For, and all of this year's school services and anything that comes out of TFGM now doesn't have that in. It works perfectly in the real world because the day doesn't exist. When the operator tries to upload it to BODS, it fails. BODS fails a whole zip for, for one change. So we're losing data. That sounds like a bit of a problem. Peter, it sounds like you're willing to follow up with David and have a bit of a chat on that one. We're able to follow up. It, it shouldn't be a problem um, uh, given what we know about the way Trans Exchange works. It's more of a Trans Exchange issue, I would suggest. Um, we, we'll just work it through as to how it should be, uh, uh, how, how it would be coded so that it wouldn't uh, fail. That's fabulous. Mike? I was just going to say that Often in real time systems, this is this the the the, the, the systems get around it by bodging it effectively for for whatever whatever the day is or the Christmas early run-ins or uh, bank holidays that are not conforming to particular templates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that that David's going on about. I think um, this is where we're coming unstuck with with trying to um, systemize everything and that the. the there's always going to be problems until everything's been thought about, if you see what I mean. Maybe part, part of the course in a way, but a bit yeah. scratchy at times. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, I think we finally got to the end. I, it, next meeting date, I think Tim will probably get in touch. It's normally December time, I think. Um, if there are any particular calls with with things people know about, I mean, it's, I'm guessing it's probably going to be in the first or second week of December. Um, oh, Mike. Yeah, sorry. I wanted to just double check with Julie um, about travel, TNDS. Is is there somewhere a, a, an, an overall explanation and schematic about how everything fits together with BODs and TNDS and what feeds what, what drives Google? Because obviously, by the sounds of it, TNDS and Travel Line drive Google. Yeah. So that's based. Yeah. Google's based on the data that comes from local authorities that that, that populates TNDS. Well, it is, and, and I and some of the data on Google is now from BOD. So they're they're taking some of the local authority data out and putting Google uh, BOD's data in, but we don't know which. So, um, as you, as I've just described, we, we've just we're just moving to a new way of providing data, which is a blend of BOD's and TNDS. And part of that will be producing regular reports and fact sheets and help sheets of why is my data different in these two places, because it's phenomenally complicated. I mean, we've got. Um, one of the operators are contacted this week where their data is slightly right on travel line and slightly right on google but in different ways and it's because they publish their data in two formats two different places a week apart and, and they don't know the answer to that and they publish the data and we can see at group level the operators that are getting in touch with and saying the same thing our data is wrong in google but it's right in travel line why is this well there are a number of reasons for that where did you publish it when did you publish it when did google take it and when did google update it and i have asked actually i've asked peter stoner at itto world who publishes the data for Google for some of the timescales so that we can understand when they publish the data, how long it takes to publish it and when it gets when it gets published on Google, which I guess is out of their control. And we don't have those timescales yet, so we don't always know the answer to that. So the best we can do is to tell our open data users and customers the best we can. Well, this is why it might be different, but we can't tell you which is right. I know that sounds nonsense, but you will get um, an explanation with the TNDS of where the data comes from each week because it will change. It might even change from day to day because we've got the ability within the new TNDS system to fall back over to local authority data if the operator doesn't publish on a on a service by service basis if we have to, although we don't want to have to do that. So, for example, TFGM at Christmas last year, the first group data wasn't good enough to go in the journey planner. It didn't have enough look ahead, so we fell back over to using the TFGM data. And then after Christmas, we went back to the operator. So it will be different from week to week. But the answer is, as far as we can, yes, we will try to explain that to our open data users. There's okay. a lot of there's a lot of stuff there, isn't there? Yeah, because because the, like the person that developed our journey planner in Leicester, they use BODs, and that, I think that was a fundamental error at the current in its current state of maturity. Yeah. yeah um, can you can you leave your um, email address in the chat? Just so of I can course I can. And if I, yeah, if anyone's got any other questions or anything else they want to talk about, exactly, just get in touch. Happy to okay. spend some time. Okay. I did want to say, Julie, sorry, I was keen to try and get through it all, but what a fantastic okay. update. And um, yeah. you said, oh, there's only four of us. We should be able to do a bit. Was it only been three years now? Four, we should be able to do a bit more. <laughs> it's quite a lot already that you're turning through. So, yeah, but we're not consultants, you know, we, we're just going to make these things. So it's easier <laughs> when we haven't got massive organisations that we work for. Yeah, and we yeah, haven't yeah. got huge um, public facing contracts to, to deal with. So our we're much more able to work quickly than some big organisations, unfortunately. Yeah. So. No, I know it's, it's the way of the world. Um, yes. We have got through everything. I know there were probably a few comments. Uh, oh, Dan's got his thumbs up there. Fantastic. There's loads in the chat. I'm going to have to see if I can get some of that off of Tim uh, to make sure we don't miss stuff. It's been, I mean, it's been a whirlwind of a session, I think. There's been loads of stuff backwards and forwards lots of updates from people lots of great work going on can you stay on at the end trees of me to ask you about yeah yeah, yeah very happy to. i don't know whether Good. nick will be around but i mean okay. it's, it's any other questions comments thoughts from people that you want noted any other business any other bits and pieces it's nice to see people this time as well a few people are brave enough to turn their cameras on <laughs> um fantastic stuff in which case um, yeah, we'll leave Tim with the dates for December. I mean, it probably be fairly, I can't remember when it is. It's normally about the 10th ish or whatever that is. I'm not quite sure, but he'll probably send that round. So I think if there's no other thoughts from anyone, thank you so much. Thank you for being patient with Nick and I trying to lead, chair this through. Hope Tim gets better soon and um, catch you all on the next PTIC in December. Okay. Well, Thanks, Thanks, very much. Thanks so much, everyone. See ya. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. bye.